I lost everything. The banks froze everything I had. That was my whole net worth at the time. I had like 200 grand roughly. Subhanallah, it really, really affected me. It's like, how am I supposed to provide, you know, for my family? 25k a month. Fast, Achi. First ever business. I started to think that, yo, man's good at business. You get me? Allah taught me a lesson the hard way. The business disappeared. I was, it was actually shut down by force. I was literally gone week to week on many occasions when it came to paying the bills, putting food in the table. And, th and can you imagine, bro, like, I've got kids, I've got a family, and I'm out here struggling to put food on the table after having made that type of money. And there's a huge element of shame in that, bro. When I came to the States, I was 16 years old. Door knocking to get a job. Finally, I get this job. They offered me $4.50. Take it or leave it. We'll pay cash. And the job was 12 a.m. to 8 a.m. People would be drunk, depressed, come to the restroom, vomit, go do some erratic things again, right? So my job was to make sure cleaning those vomit, cleaning those puke. At one point, bro, at night, I was throwing out 100, 120 garbage bags. That's when I realized, Sheikh, there is nobody coming to save you. Subhanallah, it's funny that we can sit here and he lightly talks about the situation and says, look, I look at it and I've affiliated positive memories of it. And that's the truth of the matter. The thing that you're going through right now that's so horrible, there's going to come a time if you just adjust accordingly, where it's going to be like, you know what, Subhanallah, I went through that and like, yeah, off of the back of me losing the 200 grand, I made the most money I've ever made in my life for following the next six months. And like, I'm sure brother Sam, he's thinking, I went through vomit, I went through cleaning, I left the river and I still got here. That's the beauty. Allah still allowed me to walk through everything. If I hadn't gone through that L, I wouldn't know how to deal with this. Use that to get ahead. Allah wants good for me. Allah loves me. Mm. He has a plan for me. Good things are ahead of me. Well, that's what's gonna be for you, bro. This dunya is a revealer. It's a revealer of who you really are. Assalamu alaikum guys. Before we begin, I really wanted to share some great news with you. So as I've been screaming at the top of my lungs for the last few months, we're on a mission to help bring about 1,000 righteous and rich Muslim millionaires. And the way that we've been trying to achieve this goal with the last permission is by providing sales and marketing solutions in two ways, either through educating business owners on how to grow their businesses from the sales and marketing perspective, or by just building out their entire marketing funnel and taking care of their lead acquisition, their sales, everything from click to close. And alhamdulillah, we've already seen so much success. And I wanted to share that with you. So we have young brothers joining our Righteous and Rich Stores Academy and they're learning the skills of business and they're growing. They're getting their first high ticket sale, $1,000 close, $2,000 close, $2,000 close, $3,000 close. Alhamdulillah. We've also got our clients on the click to close where we build everything up for them, such as brother Big Isa, who is now making double what he was making from his nine to five online. We also have the new fit brothers who Allah Mabarak hit their first ever $10,000 a month. <laughs> so Alhamdulillah guys, if you want more information on how you can also get access to our sales and marketing solutions to grow your business so you can do the things that really matter in life such as move to a Muslim country, give charity and take care of your family, then click on the link below. Click on the link for the Righteous and Rich Skills Academy if you want to learn and do it yourself but you want our support and training and click on the link for the scale initiative if you want to get on the phone to one of our team members to see if you qualify for us building this out for you from beginning to end. With that said, this is going to be a very important podcast, very serious topic. Let's begin. May Allah bless you. Assalamu alaikum. Let's start. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah amma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brothers, and if there are any sisters that are watching, today's guests are brothers that have been at rock bottom. And with Allah's just permission, they found a way to get out of it and amount, massive amounts of success. Far from their peaks, they are firmly on the part, on the trajectory towards great success. I wanted to bring them here today so we can dissect exactly what it was about them and the things that they did that helped them get out of these difficult situations in life. To my right, we have Brother Sam, alhamdulillah, who came to the US from Bangladesh as an immigrant in his early teenage years. He used to clean vomit at 1 a.m. in restaurants and he used to throw out the trash and mentioned that you used to cry. Yeah. And since then, Allah allowed you to pick yourself up. Alhamdulillah. And you are now an eight-figure entrepreneur who's battling riba. Allah ma'bad. Alhamdulillah. We have brother Fawaz, also to the right of brother Sam, who as a young man, this is very inspiring. You know, when most of the kids are doing fraud, selling drugs, was making like 10K a month, Allah ma'bad. Sure. And he made a million by the age of 20, Allah ma'bad. Nice. And currently is a performance coach for six, seven figure entrepreneurs, helping them to unlock their potential. I'm one of them. And then to my left, we have brother Mahdi, 
Married at the age of 16, Allah Mubarak. Went through some serious trials and tribulations. Like you lost a child. May Allah have mercy on him and grant you the reward of the sabr in your family um, in your early 20s. Your business went down the drain. But since then, you picked yourself back up. You have founded, as far as I'm concerned, the only proper community for high performing, wealthy Muslim men called Black Label. I'm here today to discuss with these brothers. How? How they managed to achieve these things despite the odds being stacked against them and despite the difficult circumstances. So the objective is after today, no more victim mentality. None of this nonsense. Mm. It's time to get to work. Inshallah ta'ala. So the first question, Faraz, I'm going to throw this at you, bro. So when you're at your lowest point in life, what part of your identity did you feel was most broken? And what part of you did you feel had to heal and improve in order for you to get out of that difficult spot? Perfect. Bismillah. Um, I think what I've noticed with myself is the more trials and tribulations naturally you go through, mm. the more normal it becomes. Mm. Right? And that's a key thing. So even when you're destroyed and everything, and when I've been at the stage where I've been most broken, I just simply understand there's what a was process. That? The stage, to be honest with you, the probably most difficult stage was when I lost everything. The banks froze everything I had. That was my whole net worth at the time. I had like 200 grand roughly. Um, it was in different places. And I wanted to, at the time, I think yeah, maybe 19, something like that. Uh -huh. um, at the time I wanted to buy a new property um, in Morocco. Um, I wanted to get more because I already had one. So then I'd moved all the money into my account, like a silly guy. Um, and that's when the banks froze everything I had. And it, I still don't have a back till today. It's still frozen. Oh, wow. So that was my whole net worth at the time. Like that's everything I had. And naturally when you have a company, you have people depending on you, family, etc. to not be able to like take out what's yours. It's very frustrating. I remember I was even at Egypt studying uh, as well at the time. And that's, that's what made it all the more difficult, mm -hmm. you know? Um, SubhanAllah, it really, really affected me because then it's like, how, how am I supposed to provide you know, for my family, et cetera. Am I supposed to take care? Like I'm abroad, you know, it's difficult. I'm spending loads of like the few, like thousands that I have left, like access to. I'm spending all like calling back because of roaming, et cetera. I'm spending on the phone to the banks and they're, they're not budging, right? Um, so that's when it was a difficult stage, you know? At that point, sort of my identity was my money. I mean, ever since I was very young, I've been able to buy things that I want. I've gone through stages of like being broke, et cetera, but now I'm technically in debt. I have, you know, clients that I need to pay for certain things. Yeah, need some of our clients that we used to work with. Um, so, so now not only have I lost everything, like I'm below the ground. And um, I think that was definitely the most difficult period I've ever faced in, in the journey, you know? But it was the mentality and the understanding that, look, if you have made the money once before, Mm. You can make it again. Make it again, yeah. And that's the the statement I kept repeating to myself because I always used to say it's hell ironically, and I believe it's why Allah probably tested me with this um, trial. I used to say like, look, once you know the laws, you know the laws. If Allah took everything away from me, I'd make it back again. Now, I used it to say that. Yes, but it wasn't from a place of like arrogance. It was more a place of like, once you understand the laws, you understand the laws okay. on how to make it. You know. So, you had a similar situation because you had a business that was doing very well, Alarm Vedic, and then suddenly that went down the drain. Yeah. So, did you have a similar feeling of like, oh, snap, I've just lost everything, what do I do? So, that business that I had, I, I started it in 2015. It was a skincare business after I had just got axed from my job as an English teacher in Saudi Arabia. And there was a product there, it's actually called Marham Burtuqali in Medina, which the exact translation is orange cream. And it was a product used for all variety of skincare conditions, or skin conditions, I should say, but mainly people bought it for eczema and psoriasis. So that was the first business I ever started. I came back to the UK and I had decided for myself that I didn't want to be in that vulnerable position again as I was in Saudi because I was about to bring my family over. I was about to invest mm -hmm. the majority of what I had saved that year to bring my family over only to be found out on a dime that, sorry, bro, your contract's done. You're out of here. 
So I started this thing and I thought, yalla, let's see, let's see if I can sell it. And the blessing of that product was also, you could say, for want of a better word, a curse as well. Because it did so well, so quickly, I started making 10 times what I was making as an English teacher within the first three months. Per month, right? How much was that? 25k a month. Oh, I'm better. Yeah, like fast, Achi. For our first business. First ever business, right? <laughs> yeah. So I started to think that, yo, man's good at business. Yeah. You get me? And this went on for a good few years where I was, subhanAllah, one statement. I'm actually embarrassed to say it, but I'll say it for the purpose of the podcast. I remember saying once to my wife, I said to her, you know, I don't understand how, how people can be broke. Like, why don't they just go and sell something on eBay or something? Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? Subhanallah, Allah al mustahan and then alhamdulillah, praise be to Allah, Allah taught me a lesson the hard way. The business vanished, the business disappeared. I was, it was actually shut down by force because I wasn't complying with certain regulations in the UK that I was unaware of. But unaware or not, you're going to get shut down. Shut down, I thought, minor, light work. I'll just start another one. Easy, right? And that's when I went through a string of uh, business failures, back-to-back -back business failures over and over and over and over and over. Various different products that I tried to sell and whatnot. It just wasn't happening for me. It wasn't working for me. And I was literally going week to week on many occasions when it came to paying the bills, putting food in the table. And, th and can you imagine, bro, like, I'm in my mid-20s now, okay? Mid to late 20s mid 20s like 27 28 i've got kids i've got a family mm. and i'm out here struggling to put food on the table and after uh, or after having made that type of money it's mm. one Did it's you save save I, to be honest with you i i made some investments mm. okay i thought i was being smart at the time i ended up investing in things that i completely didn't understand mm. and i was fleeced mm. i was completely fleeced mm. so i thought i was being smart i wasn't so not only was I broke, but I had, you know, when the higher up the mountain you go, the harder the fall. Yeah. yeah. So now there was this element of deep shame as well. But exactly what to, to echo what you said just, uh, just now, if I was as well, which was, I knew in my mind that despite this trial that I may be going through right now, I've done it once before. Mm. And a mind once expand to new proportions never shrinks to its original size. Mm. So I knew that I had to just continue persevering getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I knew he was also humbling me and teaching me a lesson as well because, and I would remember those statements that would come out of my mouth. Mm. I would remember them and I'd be like, okay, this process is a necessary process for the refinement of my character. That's actually deep. You know, there's actually a statement of Muhammad ibn Sirin, rahimahullah. He, when he, in his older years, he, um, I, th I think, I think if I, if the, if I, I hope I got the story correct in terms of who the imam was, but, he um, had to go to jail because of a debt that he owed. And um, he cried. He said, I know why this is happening to me. He said, because I looked down on a man once who was, who was broke. SubhanAllah. Because I looked down on a man once who was broke. Yeah, yeah. Well, Allah, well, I can relate to that. I, yeah. I felt that. I felt that. You, you, you know, Sam, your story is a bit interesting in the sense where, because you was doing real estate and then you're like, you know what? I can't get involved in this very bad stuff. Allah mm. embedded. So I feel like everyone here has got a story of I had it, I lost it, and now I have to rebuild it. I never had it. Huh? I never had it to lose. <laughs> okay, I mean, I was from an angle of like, yeah. you're in a, you, you, it just seemed like your uphill climb was pretty exactly. steep because you, you had to find a way to make it in an industry where, so you're making money, but how do I do it without riba? Mm -hmm. So when, when, tell me about that moment where you accepted, like, I can't do this river thing. Bro. Yeah. What was that moment like? Yeah. And then, and then, and then how did you bounce back from it and be like, you know what? I'm going to challenge the status quo in this industry mm -hmm. and I'm going to do what I'm doing, but without riba. Right. How did you have the nerves to even do that? Yep. So I'll be honest with everyone, right? So when I started, um, I started practicing 2012, 2013. Mm. That's when I started real estate as well. I was not seeking riba for myself, mm. but I was helping clients that were getting houses through riba. Finance. Fi yeah, finances and stuff, right? I did not think too deep about it. Mm -hmm. Then around 2016, 2017, I actually got involved in a transaction where I'm not taking riba myself, 
but the whole big, the development side we were talking about, like the people were taking riba. Mm. The management was taking riba and I just invested in that pool. Mm. And that pool was taking riba. So mm. not under my name again, but it's in that investment. It's, yeah, it's in that investment, correct? And that year, Sheikh, so my first daughter was born uh, in 2018. That was a year of complete barak, alhamdulillah. Um, I made that investment in 2017, a year before she was born. The return started coming in in 2019, the year after she was born. Okay. And that year, after a year full of barakah, was the worst year, subhanAllah. Really? Like a random thing started happening as soon as I started consuming that money. And I wasn't thinking that way. Oh, wow. Then I started connecting the dots. And me and my wife, we sat down and we're like, what's wrong? You know, Shaykh, like things like, Alhamdulillah, I never used to get sick. I started getting sick often. Really? Alhamdulillah. Yeah, like my car um, would get flat. My wife would get in trouble. Like this would happen in the shopping mall. Like weird stuff would start happening. Um, then we realized the only thing we're doing wrong, you know, in terms of major sins where we're completely displeasing Allah is taking riba. And we just need to completely stop that. So that's when I realized. And then I started reading more about the harms of riba and completely... You know, uh, I forgot the hadith, Sheikh. Maybe you can remind me. You know, the, the smell of the scent of riba will enter something along the line. Professor mm -hmm. said, like, it will be hard to even stay away from the, the smell of riba. Something along that line. The, uh, as in the dust of it. Dust, yes, yeah. yes, yes. But we have to try our best that we're not directly participating in the system, mm -hmm. right? And at the same time, I want to quickly mention this story. Shout out to, uh, mashallah, Wahid Invest. I met the CEO of Wahid, Junaid. This brother is on a mission, like a mission to eradicate riba from the world. And when you talk to him, and it's not like I want to eradicate riba from the world, and like a Power Ranger, I have two swords, you know? He actually has a plan in place. And literally, he believes in that plan. And once you talk to him, you would also believe like this is possible within our generation to completely eradicate riba from the world. Not from my locality or from here, from the world. After talking to him, looking at his plan, you would completely believe it, right? I was like, man, people like him are doing this level. Hmm. I don't even have to have the mission of eradicating riba from the world. So you heard about him before you started and embarked on? So it was on the same around the same time. Same time. So it helped me make my vision. Why am I thinking so small? Mm -hmm. Why am I thinking so small? My mission would be maybe not as big as his to eradicate riba from the world, but I can eradicate riba from Muslim real estate community. Mashallah. And that's what inspired me. So since twenty. Late 2018 to 2019, I, since then I've not taken any riba, no transactions, nothing, completely riba free. And life hasn't been more blessed, alhamdulillah. Allahumma barik. So you're saying that having someone at the time who was going through the exact same thing, yep. having a similar mission gave you the, the motivation to kind of push forward. Yes, because sometimes, Sheikh, we need in life to see that someone has done it. Mm. Yes. There are levels to people, right? I'm not Steve Jobs or Elon Musk to do something that nobody has done before. And you know, that's why I'm so grateful for you to you guys for actually coming on yeah. the, these podcasts and being vulnerable and sharing your stories because wallahi you have no idea and maybe you have some type of an idea but this stuff really benefits people because mm -hmm. there's people out there that are listening thinking you know what bro I'm in a similar situation you know I have to take a mortgage I have to do this I have to do that yeah. my business is not working let me just quit and give up but they will see this and feel inspired mm -hmm. they will feel like I have a chance you hear this brother Alham Badik, he got a meal he had a meal, mashallah, by the age of 20. Mashallah. So you don't have to sell drugs and do silly things and do dumb things or go to uni unnecessarily, right? Like, so it, 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 I think it's very, 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 very nice man to do that because a lot of brothers who have seen a lot of, a lot of success, mashallah, they, they, they kind of keep it to themselves. Mm. And maybe they have reasons for it, you know, because of their work, they can't come out or maybe they try to protect themselves from evil eye. Mm -hmm. But if no one does that, no one speaks and, and takes this position, mm -hmm. people are just going to be lost, man. Yep. People are going to be lost. So, Akhi Mahdi, let me, let me ask you a question. At the time when you were struggling, mm. what was one painful truth about yourself that you had to come into terms with? And how did you go about fixing it? That I'm nowhere near as good at business as I thought I was. And it took me quite a while, actually, to accept that reality because I had kind of built my identity around being this businessman, you know? Like, people start respecting you, to, to, talking to you differently. And now all of a sudden now that's all gone. That veneer <laughs> has disappeared and actually I'm not that guy. And there's a huge element of shame in that, bro. Mm. There's a huge element of shame that you got to walk around with and just like, and at one time without people clocking on, do you know what I'm saying? 
But um, how did I? What was your original question? So the question is, what was that, what was that painful truth about yourself that, that you had to come to terms with face, and then and how did you overcome it? That I'm not as good as I thought I was. Mm. And actually, to this day, we did a podcast with Sam the other day, and yeah, he asked me, you know, how did you become a good businessman? And I said to him, actually, I'm not a good businessman. I would say I'm a mediocre businessman, average at best, and I mean that. But my skill set is in dealing with people. I have, uh, a, generally speaking, alhamdulillah, I'm good at dealing with people. And if you can deal with people well, they will have the skill sets that you are lacking. Mm. I give the example of PPC experts or SEO experts mm. or graphic design experts. And I can't, bro, I can't tell you how much work we have gotten done, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, on paper for free. But it's not for free. There's been an exchange of value of some sort. You see, someone's done something just through finding out what problems can I solve with this guy? Mm. How can I solve his problems? Mm. And then get into that mm. and then bartering, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Have you ever felt like that for us? You're not as good as you thought you were. 100%. I think um, when you can't provide as a man, like that's, that's something different, especially like, like he said, when people look at you and place you a certain role, this is actually where I had to leave my hometown. Um, and I left to Egypt as one of the reasons as well. And I remember even the year before I moved to Egypt, I'd left my hometown. I remember looking at my mom saying, I can't come back here anymore. Because it's, it becomes an, eco cha- an echo chamber, right? You're constantly hearing the same things. You're so amazing. You're sick. You've done amazing. Wait, is this you're, before you, your stuff got this frozen? This is before. Before, yeah. okay, okay. So it, it kind of puts you at this high horse. Everyone's telling you you're doing so well, mm. right? Everyone's telling you you are the man. You've done this. People look to you mm. when they need something, right? And look, I've, alhamdulillah, I've always been the type of guy in my family. If there's something needed, I, like that's how we all are with each other, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's provided. But I've never, ever, like in my life had to say no. Mm-hmm. And that period of time, like I was being asked for things I, I couldn't, mm-hmm. but I still couldn't and didn't say no. And isn't it weird? Because everyone just won't believe you if you say, yo, I come struggling right now. Yeah. You can't, you can't, I, I couldn't even, like, I've tried. That's the worst feeling in it. It's like, I actually want to help. But in, as far as everyone's concerned, this guy's loaded. Yeah. He got stacked. <laughs> I've, I've genuinely tried to, like, you know, I, I can't, you know. I, well, I don't know if it's a pride thing or whatever, but for me, it's just, you know, I do believe there's a hadith as well where the Prophet ﷺ talks about the one who what, doesn't seek yani, too much aid with the people. He mm-hmm. seeks yani, f- only with Allah. And he does his best. Allah will, will make the means for him. And that was sort of my mentality as well. That, of course, if you need, need help, you need, need help. Mm. But um, I still didn't say no to my family. And I think that was one of the greatest things that choices I made. Mm. Still never to say no. Until this day, even if somebody calls me for something like family and I don't have it, it's okay, I'm coming and not no. Mm. And that's a principle I've embedded now in my life. And it only encouraged me to actually go back and actually go make the money, go do the things. So there's multiple times in my life, like I, I remember even when we, we were sitting down with like, you know, a group, because like I said, when you're in an echo chamber, you're around people, the same people, you hear the same things. So you think your knowledge on business is amazing. It's not that you're a 10, you're just around other threes. Does that make sense? Which gives you the perception that you're a 10. Mm. So when I started to sit in these room with these guys that are revenueing what I make in a year and a month, it put things into perspective for me. Mm. It's like, no, you don't know what you don't know, right? And it's upon you to go out and learn. Like, this is what I'm telling people. You need to step out of your environment sometimes. You know, I was so happy with the Righteous Rides Retreat. And I was glad some of the brothers got to taste that around me. Because I've seen that sometimes, you know, they think, oh, I'm actually doing amazing. Right? And I remember that complacency and that mindset is what killed me. And that's when Mm -hmm. everything became destroyed. Mm -hmm. To be fair, me losing the 200k, I can't blame that on the bank. I should not have put myself in that situation in the first place. All right? Um, I should have been smarter with knowing how to play, move my money around. I should have been smarter with the regulations, etc. Not to follow them, right? I don't believe in following them, but knowing how to avoid them, <laughs> right? Navigate. Yeah, how to navigate precisely, right? I, I don't believe in like following every law by the book. You have to know how to play, especially in the West, right? But so I blame he, myself. He, and by the way, he means legally. <laughs> <laughs> Avoidance, not evasion, they say, right? So I, I do blame myself for that aspect. And I blame myself for the fact that I had become so confident in one thing and i hadn't diversified well enough you know i i, I love that mindset bro and to be honest it's one of the things that one of the, one of the reasons why um i feel like i don't see eye to eye with a lot of people man that, that that concept of 
not taking ownership of your else. Extreme ownership. Like, yeah, extreme ownership. I'm, I'm a firm believer, bro. Like, there was, there, there, there was a mistake I made in this. The, and, and that's just how I live my life. And that's the standard I hold to myself. And I hold people on my team to that standard as well. If you don't have that mentality, bro, you can go. And you know, I was actually just deep in. That's exactly what Yunus al Islam did. You know, when he was in the, in, in, in the well. Yeah. yeah. What was it? What was it? What was, what was his call to Allah? La ilaha illa and subhanak inni kuntum min al-zalimin. Allah, I was the oppressor. I wronged myself. What did he do, bro? He just left his people who weren't listening to him. And he, and when, when you deep it, it's like, you might think it wasn't such a big deal, right? What, what was his mistake? He didn't ask Allah's permission before he left. Subhanallah. He just left. You know what I'm saying? But it's like, even in something that, and by the way, scholars say this wasn't actually a sin. Like, it wasn't like a sin. It was a mistake. There's a difference between a sin and a mistake. mistake yeah. But Allah caused the world to, the, or, or the sea creature to, to devour him. Mm-hmm. And all he, all he could say was, Allah, I'm wrong. Yeah. You are perfect. You are the only one that's actually worshiping truth. I am wrong. I am wrong. And if you take control of your L's, it actually gives you hope because now you can do something about it. And it's, it's a quicker feedback loop as well. Is what what do you mean by that? People don't consider. You look, a lot of people talk about experience. Experience means nothing. Experience is a bunch of rubbish, right? Experience doesn't mean anything in life if you don't reflect over the experience. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It only matters if you sit back and reflect. How could I have improved in a situation? I say, if I'm walking on the street and a man crosses the street and slaps me, somehow it's still my fault. Why in my, the way I'm walking, why in my posture did he think he could walk over and slap me and there'd be no consequences? It's still my fault. Yeah. And when you look at things with that mentality, from looking at the situation, like, I could be like, okay, it's time for you to go gym. Or I could just cry about the guy crossing the road and hitting me. So once you actually reflect over every experience in life, which is what we should do, by the way, you know, I actually read a quote by Ibn al-Jawzi and in, in one of his books, he says, the one who doesn't reflect is not from us. Oh, wow. That, that quote shook my heart because it shows you, the Prophet ﷺ also said, A believer doesn't fall into the same hole twice. How do you ensure you don't make the same mistakes twice? By reflecting on a situation. I could say, yeah, my employee is trash, blah, blah, blah. I could say, okay, in what ways did I not allow him to be the best person he did? You know what, why did I hire him? I, I, I just want to dive into this. I want to get everyone's perspective here on this point. Why, why, Mahdi, why is it that people can't hold their own L's, man? Why don't they take ownership over their own losses? You know, before I answer that question, I'll segue into the opposite of this. And I will answer your question, uh-huh. which is... And I've seen this uh, in the online space a lot, mainly with the non-Muslims, but it's starting to creep amongst the Muslims as well. I know, alhamdulillah, you brothers don't have this, but we need to point it out for the audience because Mm. extreme ownership of your L's, yes. But a lot of the time, these quote-unquote successful guys like to tout that message as a way of polishing their own halo. Everything's my fault. Also, I'm rich because it's my fault. Anything you good you have is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He facilitated that for you. He gave you that opportunity. He facil- brought these people around you. He gave you the intelligence to be able to execute the, 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 the health in your body, things of this nature. And I, I really want to point that point out. Because if Allah says in the Quran, mm-hmm. if, And your Lord has decreed, if you give thanks, He will give you more. Mm-hmm. So uh, whilst I'm completely on board with the extreme ownership, I just wanted to point that bit out there. It's important. Mm-hmm. Any good you experience, yes. وَأَلَّيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى And man will, not get, man will not get except what he works for. طَيِّبْ mm-hmm. I accept this. But any uh, quote-unquote success you experience is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm-hmm. And we have to attribute that exclusively to it's not because of you, bro. Mm-hmm. It's because Allah has given you this. طَيِّبْ Okay, let's put that to the side. Now, why do people find it difficult to, uh, to, to own their L's? Mm-hmm. Because well, Why this victim mentality? Why this just blaming everyone else except for yourself? Because it requires one to humble themselves and accept that there's something wrong with them. There is something defective inside of you. Mm. And defective is not a bad thing. Mm. We, have, it's, we, we need to improve. But most people find this very difficult. And I saying to Brother Sam the other day, you will find two, two types of entrepreneurs. The extreme AWS hole, okay, who's completely insufferable. <laughs> and then the, the entrepreneur who is extremely humble. Entrepreneurship does that to you. You can either become this guy here or it will humble you extremely. Why? Because we fail the most, man. Mm. <laughs> we fail the most. Yeah, big time. We go through the most failures. 
And if you come out the right side of that, it will humble you mm. to the point. And that's when you're like, you know what? It's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's very difficult for the layman to accept that there's something wrong with me because he sees it as like uh, a, a, a reflection of himself, like there's something wrong with him. No, you're not a, a wrong person or a bad person. There is just some defect in your knowledge or your execution or your hiring or whatever that needs to be addressed. That's it. Do you think Sam is also on top of that? And I believe it's, that's a part of it. But also, Yashi, if you, if, you, if you acknowledge that this is wrong, mm. then you actually have to do something to fix it. Yep. And most people would rather just be complacent and let life happen to them as opposed to actually grabbing Ford. the bull by the horns. Yeah. I think also, Sheikh, the society had a big role to play in it. Mm. For example, um, the concept of participation trophy. Yeah, that I hate. Right. Just, like, <laughs> just because you participated, you should get a trophy. <laughs> right? Oh, you did not win, you're still the best. You, know? <laughs> you did not win, you're still the best. No, you. if you win, you are the best. Right? <laughs> so this, the message from society that we've been getting from decades, right? It's, it's okay to lose. Mm. And, you know, I don't know here or in the UK, but the word fat is like offensive in America. Mm. In the UK too. Oh, you Sucks. cannot call people fat. I could not believe it. Like, I would call myself fat and be like, bro, no, no, you're not fat. I'm like, no, dude, <laughs> I am fat. <laughs> like, it's rude to call someone fat, to call people out. And of course, it has to be done respectfully. Yeah. Uh, but within the respect paradigm, within the respect framework, I think we have lost that as a society. Mm. Um, calling people out and letting them know, like, hey, this is what it is. And if I was to write a book, let's say, brother, on 10 business principles that mm -hmm. I live by, extreme ownership would be in top five. Really? Yeah, because this is the only thing you can control. Three feet around me. This mm -hmm. is the only thing I can control. I cannot control the economy. I cannot control who's the president. And none of those actually matter. Mm. In, the, in the micro of things, none of those matter. These are just the media's way to get your attention. Yeah, your voting matters. Who's the president matters. I made money when Trump was president. I made money when Biden was president. I started making money when Obama was president, believe oh, it or wow. not, right? So, <laughs> so it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who's the president. It's extreme ownership. What am I doing? Have you guys heard of a lady called Helen Keller? Yep. This one, I looked into this lady, blew my mind, man. She was mm -hmm. born deaf. She was born blind. Swallow. Both. Yeah, she learned how to speak three languages. Wow. German, French. And English. And she ended up traveling the world and created a foundation to help people that are suffering from problems in their eyes, you know, like to help blind people. But if a, if a woman who's born deaf and blind mm. can learn three, like think about it. How do you, she can't even learn sign language because she's right. blind. Right. She can't hear. Like, I think what she used to do was she used to place her hand on people's mouth and just feel the vibrations and work out what they were saying. Wow. And through that process, wow. She, she learned like, all these different languages. Yep. So the, what excuse do you have? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? What excuse do you have, man? And I think also the Sheikh, sorry, um, the immigrant mentality. Like a lot of us came or our parents came. We want to use the system. We want to eat from the welfare. Uh, we want to work as less as possible mm. and get from the government as much as possible. Right. And when we see our parents doing that, my parents did that too. We, it's hard to snap out of it. Mm -hmm. It's hard to snap out of it and, and knowing that this is something looked down upon, even in a religion, mm -hmm. the handouts, mm -hmm. right? Um, you have to take extreme ownership for what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So I, let's go back then to yourself in that restaurant, mm -hmm. 1 a.m. in the morning, you're in the toilet cleaning people's puke. Mm -hmm. How did that feel, bro, at that time? Yeah, man. What was so, going through your mind? Yeah, so I came from a lower middle class family, but of course in Bangladesh, in any Middle Eastern Asian country, you don't clean stuff up. <laughs> Even if you come from lower middle class, there's people to clean after you to do those things, right? Mm -hmm. So I was not trained to, you know, wash your own dish or those kind of things, right? Good or bad, I don't know. When I came to the, to the States, I was 16 years old, uh, and it was 2009. Right. I was blessed to come in 2009 because that's when the Great Recession of our era happened. Right. Mm -hmm. So you had to door knock in America, door knock to get a job. Literally, I door knocked for three months and we came in February, winter time. I was door knocking 16 year old. I've never done that in my life. Door knocking to get a job. Finally, I get this job in downtown French restaurant. They offered me the minimum wage at that time was seven dollars, 25 cents mm. okay, per hour. They offered me four dollars, 50 cents. Take it or leave it. We'll pay cash because it's a recession, you know? I was like, yes, yeah, sure, let's do it. And the job was 12 a.m. to 8 a.m. People would be drunk, depressed, 
come to the restroom, vomit, and take like a big French fries and burger to fill themselves in and go do some some heretic things again, right? So my job was to make sure cleaning those vomit, cleaning those puke, you know? And at that point, coming from somewhere where I n have never done that to doing this and not knowing where I'm going with cleaning garbage because there's no clear path. And I was at one point, bro, at night, I was throwing out 100, 120 garbage bags, like five gallon big garbage bags. You know, 100? From, yeah, 100 to 120 from, from downstairs, like climb up the stairs and put it in the streets of Manhattan, you know, and drunk people are walking by. Come back, then clean the restroom. Do that again. Keep repeating that for, the, for eight hours a night. That's when I realized, Sheikh, that there is nobody coming to save you. Oh, wow. It's you. That's it. There's nobody coming to give you this handout. Your parents don't know what you're doing. They're thinking my, my boy works in a restaurant in Manhattan in downtown. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a prestigious thing to do, right? So it's you versus you at that time. And that time the realization came, either I take it up on myself to learn from this, like powerful thing Fala's touched on. Experience means nothing. You have to reflect on this, on this experience. When I started doing Sheikh, systemizing what I'm doing, Okay, I'm throwing 120 garbage bags. I started timing myself. Okay, started competing against myself because you got to pass the time. Okay, it's taking me one and a half hour to do it. Tomorrow, I'm going to do it in one hour, 25 minutes. Next day, in one hour, 20. Next day, in one hour, 15. Okay, bathroom cleaning is this much time. I'm going to do this. I started making myself resourceful at my job because this is the only thing I could do at that time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so whatever you're doing, and everybody starts when they're 16, probably flipping burgers, working in restaurants, doing some odd job. If you, if you get into the job market at 16, and you should, you got to be the best person frying the French fries ever in the history of McDonald's. You have to be the best person serving that Coke with ice in the history of McDonald's. You have to, if you're working the cash, you have to upsell like crazy. No, you got to get the French fries, man. Otherwise, it's not going to taste good. Like the burger comes with French fries. And once you eat those salted French fries, you need <laughs> Coke after it. <laughs> you got to sell the Coke too. Like you got to be the best upseller. Like whatever position you're working on, you have to execute with proper purpose, intent, become the best. That's when Allah is going to bless you with other opportunities. Mm. Again, extreme ownership. That job, this is your responsibility to be the best at it. So Mahdi, coming back to bringing this point of extreme ownership back to you, bro. Sometimes life happens. When I say life happens, meaning Allah is able to test you with things. Obviously, you were tested with something that was very tough, man. We talked about it on the previous podcast. Um, when something like that happens, bro, how do you maintain and just make sure you don't lose sight of your responsibilities as a man, take care of your family, you have other children, you've got work, you've got to grind. But you feel this pain of like having lost like your child, man. <clears throat> I'm being honest with you, bro. I don't know how people survive without being Muslim. And I read that. And not just Muslim with lip service, like like a practicing Muslim. Because it was uh, uh, the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, you know, got me through that period when my son passed away suddenly. That's it, bro. Like getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I don't know what else to say like, I genuinely feel sorry for non-Muslims who don't have Islam because I, I don't life's too hard without Islam I don't know how you man are doing it in a weird way I kind of rate you that you're still around you're still alive you haven't like topped yourself and you don't have Islam I think these drugs and alcohol to numb the pain isn't maybe, it? maybe. Right. yeah it numbs the pain yeah the pork keeps you warm inside <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so look, when you when you say you was worshiping Allah, like what, what what do you mean? What does that what does that look like? Just getting close to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, oh. yeah, increasing in the Quran. You know, Mahar al Maikli. Okay, okay. Mahar al Maikli. Whenever I hear him, I just came back from Mecca a couple of weeks ago. Uh -huh. He actually led one of the the salah there. Whenever I hear Mahar al Maikli, mm -hmm. I think of the week after my son died, between the point that he died to the point that we buried him, because that week I already had his CD, his CDs at the time his CD in the car and we, we would play it but we were playing it extra that week you know and it was the last uh, last three edges out of the Quran as well so whenever I hear Mahal Ma'aqli he re it reminds me of that time but it's not like it's, it's like nostalgic in a way like, yeah. it, like it's like a positive memory yeah. you know I have taken this, this emotion here of something that is on paper difficult to deal with and it is 
But now I've connected it towards getting closer towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, you know, that's actually insane from the angle of some, like, some people are not going to understand that because when there's, whenever there's a tragic issue, mm. uh, a, a thing that people go through in life, and there's something that reminds them of that memory, they don't have a positive association. No, I have And this actually is like, yeah. I want people to actually just deep what you said. What you said is, you have just gone through the loss of a child, bro. Mm. Yet you've associated a positive memory to it. And that's because of the speech of Allah. Yeah. That's literally what the speech of Allah does. Like when Allah says, and dhikri fa inna lahum It turns away from the Quran, we have a depressed life. And rather in the remembrance of Allah, i.e. the Quran, the hearts they find peace. So <laughs> something which is the most tragic memory can have positive, um, have a positive effect because the Quran was connected to it. That's actually... and, and, and to get more granular on that, actually, uh, because we would go to the, uh, the morgue. He was kept in. A, so basically what happened was after he because he died suddenly, SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, which was not diagnosed at that time. The first two suspects on the scene are me and me and the mum, me and me and my wife at the time. So it's not a very nice thing to go through, but you are number one suspect, of course. right? Yeah. So what they did was they took his brain out and they took that for biopsies and autopsies and whatnot, okay? So his body was in the morgue between, he passed away on a Friday night, between Saturday morning and the following Thursday, his body was in the morgue and we would go to see him daily. And I'm able to speak about this, like without it, you know, getting me down or whatever, because every time we would make that journey, bro, Mahal Ma'iqli would be on in the car. And it's, it was sad and something difficult to go through. Don't get me wrong, I'm not underplaying that. I'm just saying, like, I have a positive emotion to it, akhi. So yani, amazing is the affair of the believer. Mm. You know the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. So whenever I think of that moment, I think of those surahs that were played in that time. I think of he will intercede for me and his mother in Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Yani, what is there to commiserate? Mm. You know? Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Actually, um, I'm currently reading a book by Imam Ibn Qayyim. It's called Tuhfatul Mawlud. Uh, it's basically a book about rulings for um, newborn children. Because a few of my friends had kids <laughs> one time. So we started going through this with my sheikh. And he says something at the beginning of Ibn Qayyim. He says, a child is a blessing whether he lives or he dies. Oh. He says, if the child lives, he outlives the parent, sorry. He makes the for the parent. If the child dies early, he intercedes for the parent. And helps him get to Jannah. Subhanallah. So, it's powerful. Yeah, but I'm saying that's the, that, as you said, it's the, that's that's the deen. Like that's the deen. That's the deen. Like, that's yeah. I don't know how these men are coping without the deen. Akhi. What's even more tragic yeah, is there's Muslims who have this right under their nose, and they're not mm. using it. Mm. You know, they actually have this underneath their nose, and they're not and they're not using it. You know, there's um, there's a there's two powerful moments in the Sirah of the Prophet. By the way. You guys can jump in at any time and ask each other questions, sure. you know? This is very easy here. There's, a, there's, there's, there's two powerful moments in the Sirah of the Prophet that really kind of show um, how the Prophet would cultivate his companions, man, towards not being, not, 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 not entertaining psychological defeat, not having a victim mentality, and um, working hard despite difficult situations. So the story of Ammar ibn Yasir radiallahu anhu, who was a young man, who saw his mother be killed in front of him, Abu Jahl. Mm -hmm. He stabbed her with a spear in yep. between her legs and killed her. Then his father, Yasser, was killed. And I remember hearing a narration many years ago that he was killed by, um, they, 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 they tied ropes around his, his hands and his feet and then tied those ropes to different horses and they, took, and they caused the horses to charge and, uh, him apart, basically. And, and basically ripped him apart. Oh, I, I don't think he literally ripped, but he died as a result of that. Um, and then they tortured him, this, this, the son who just saw his parents be killed. Tortured him until he uttered a statement of kufr. Right? They tortured him until he uttered a statement of kufr. They forced him to insult the Prophet So he comes to the Prophet crying, saying, Ya Rasulullah, I said a statement of kufr. The Prophet asked him, how was your heart at the time? He said, Mutma'in bil iman. He said, my heart was firm with iman. Like I, didn't, I didn't actually mean it. Mm. I just said it out of force. The Prophet said to him, if that happens to you again, then say the same thing again. Then say the same thing okay. again. 
That's how the Prophet dealt with Ammar. Wasn't too harsh, right? Mm -hmm. Was actually gentle. No worries. Go do it again. He had another Sahabi called Khabab ibn Arad. The way they tortured him was that they lit embers underneath his back and they would burn his back. And the embers would be put out due to the fat from his belt, from his back melting. Mm -hmm. And they would put out the, the fire on the embers. Right? So he comes to the Prophet ﷺ and the hadith mentions the Prophet ﷺ is leaning against the Kaaba and he's kind of like using his, his, um, his burda, his cloak, as like a pillow. Mm -hmm. he's, he's using his cloak as like a pillow, right? And um, like relaxing. And Khabbab comes and he says, Ya Rasulullah, Ala tansiruna lana. He said, are you not going to give us victory? Are you not going to make dua to Allah for us? Do you not see what we're going through? And I'm sorry, I'm upset and angry. He said, there was a people before you who came. A ditch would be dug for them. And they would be placed in the ditch and a sword would be placed on their head and would split his body in half. And another man would come and he would have his flesh removed from his bones through iron combs. They would literally comb the flesh of his bones. And that didn't make him what? Shake on his deen. And Allah wants to give you complete victory and security in the land. But you are hasty. So, what Khabab went through mm -hmm. was not any less than what Ammar went through. I mean, yes, he saw his parents get killed as well. But in essence, bro, it reaches a point of pain and suffering where it's like, it's we're, yeah, we're not even counting now. Yeah. We're, not, it's not, we're, not, we're not putting that on the scale. Yeah, yeah this, you, you're both suffering. Mm -hmm. Yet one, the Prophet was like, don't worry, if it happens again, go do it again. And the other one, the Prophet saying to him, like basically, don't be hasty. Yeah. Firm it. Yeah. What's the difference between the two? The scholars mention, Abab came with a with like a con, with like a sense of psychological defeat. Mm. Al Saud, you know, see what's happening to us. We made dua to Allah for us, right? Ahmad didn't come with that mindset. He came with the mindset of Al Saud. Ah, I messed up. He was concerned about what he said. Oof. So Prophet didn't allow his companions to have that concept of um, of psychological defeat. He wanted them to be patient and be firm. And you know what's deep around all of that? Who had who who had the greatest suffering out of all of them? The Prophet because he's 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 got his own suffering. Yeah. They're placing the insides of uh, a slaughtered camel on his on his on, 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 on his back. They're stepping on his neck while he's doing sujood. You know, uh, all of this that they're doing, and not only that, the Prophet's seeing the suffering of all of his companions. Mm -hmm. Right. And any leader knows that, and people can't relate to this unless they're in leadership positions. You have your own pain and the pain of everyone else's that you're responsible for at the exact same time. Mm -hmm. So the Prophet had the most pain. Yet the Prophet Sallam, he's again by the Kaaba, resting his head. Yeah. You like on a pillow, like using his burda as a pillow. And the burda itself is a cloak which is expensive, beautiful, has patterns. Right. And the Prophet wearing that. I just despite the most difficult situation mm -hmm. to show a sense of you can't break us. Mm -hmm. well, I'm resting by the Kaaba. Mm -hmm. Whilst at the same time, the Prophet isn't doing that, but what's he doing on the flip side? He's planning. Strategizing. Strategizing. He sends some Sahaba to Habasha. Mm -hmm. Right? So then they can find safety. Mm -hmm. He then is planning, okay, how do we go? We need another place to go to, Al Medina. Right? He's going to Ta'if. He's strategizing the whole time. <laughs> And you just think he's relaxing and he's not allowing his companions to come, with, come like victims. Mm -hmm. So this is, this, this, is our, this is our prophet. And it's just sad that when you now see Muslims, right? Who just have this mindset, which is so weak. Faz, I feel like you have a little ta'liq on this man. You're the performance man. <laughs> I think one thing that's so profound is you have to understand why people are like this. And I, uh -huh. I want to touch on what Sam said, like society welcomes this. I think it's something that we have to be honest about. Society does, you know, welcome this victimization, etc. We're always supposed to be considerable of how people feel mm. and the things that they're going through 
and we're always supposed to have like some mad insight into their life. Like I can't say things because you don't know what he's going through. And, you know, it's just this whole concept of like, you know, my life is more difficult than yours. Mm. Everyone's trying to compare. I've been through X, Y, Z, et cetera, et cetera. And for me, that's the more you've been through, it's only more of a reason why you should be successful. And that's the only way I see it. You know, I was actually on a call the other day. And why? I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll, just one sec, I'll get to it, inshallah. I was on a call the other day and a brother told me like, he started the sentence with like, yeah, I, I'm only 16. I goes, bro, stop. I, I literally goes, bro, stop. Don't ever tell me. I was, like, what, is that supposed to change my answer to the question in some way? Sorry, what did he say? I'm 16. Oh, I'm he starts 16. Up, he was about to ask me something, right, to do with the, his, his business or whatever. 16. And then he goes, yeah, I'm 16. I'm only 16. I'm only 16 years old. But what's that supposed mm. to mean? Are you exempt? Are you excused? Should I have mercy on you because you're 16? Like, I love that you called that out, by the way. Yeah, I, I did. That's straight away. I told, told him, like, oh, bro, don't don't start the question with that. that that's I'm not going to give you any, like, sympathy points because you're 16 years old. If you want to make it, and if you're trying to perform around, like... Bro, I don't. I can't complain and say I'm 16 and I'm playing on Barcelona's 18. Like, if you don't, if you're not ready to like play at that level, then drop down to the B team, right? And that's that's the same way. And the reason why people do have that issue that that I mentioned and why people need to, why you should become more successful is you have something that pushes you more, mm. right? When you look at it, why were the Sahabas like able to just push on? And the Prophet said them as well, and all the prophets, they understood the power of what they were trying to do. It's that vision at the end of the day, that purpose that allows you to drive forward, even on the difficult days. It's, this is bigger than me. It's bigger than how I feel in this current moment in time. It's bigger, like, if you're, for example, like, you know, with, with Mahdi's situation, bro, Mahdi, I'm sure he's looking like, look, like, yeah, I've lost it, but I have children, right? And I'm going to have much, I have to look after everything. I can't get lost over this one situation does that make sense is it deep is it problematic it has harmed me in some ways yes but i can't get lost in this situation every you know it's, it's funny that we can sit here and he, he lightly talks about the situation and says look i look at it and i've affiliated positive memories of it and that's the truth of the matter the thing that you're going through right now that's so horrible there's gonna come a time if you just adjust accordingly it's going to be like, you know, it's how I went through that. And like, yeah, off of the back of me losing the 200 grand, I made the most money I've ever made in my life following the next six months. I went, I booked the trip to Umrah, I paid as much as I could, and I just made dua to Allah. I got back and I built a game plan. Everything changed in my life after. I'm thankful they took my 200K because that led me to what? Revenueing a million, right? That, that's the amazing thing. When you actually use this as like a, with that situation, I'm still going to use that and still get it done anyway. And you know what I always say? Just imagine you're, you're telling this story on stage. It sounds so much sweeter now because you're talking about I had to go through this. And like, I'm sure Brother Sam, he's thinking, I went through vomit, I went through cleaning, I left the river and I still got here. That's the beauty. Allah still allowed me to walk through everything. So, and it's, it, this is why I'm so, I, I was so connected with Surah Ankabut at, at, at a point, right? Because it's the start of how Allah starts it, right? He says, Do you think you can say you believe and you're not going to be tested? We tested those before you. And if you think of it, every single one of the prophets, they went through difficulty. Like, I don't know why we like to act like it's new or the problems we're facing. Uh, yani, no one's ever faced them before. I'm sure in some way, in some shape or form, there's a prophet that went through a similar issue, right? And when you look at the concept of life like that, it's like, you know what? It's fine. Allah says, we will not test a soul beyond what it can, it can bear. So if I'm being tested with this thing, I can bear it. And Perhaps Allah is trying to show me something or prepare me for something. There's all a situation we all went through. And now in our lives, we're like, if I hadn't gone through that L, I wouldn't know how to equip it this time. I wouldn't know how to deal with this. And that for me is yep. the main thing. Why? You have more experience, reflect more on it, and use that to get ahead of everyone else. For people who have been yani, abused in certain ways, maybe physically, yani, mentally abused or trauma. You have that experience. You have that insight. Use that to get ahead. No, I will never be able to understand physical abuse like you. I've never been physically abused. Use that. Leverage every weakness, every L you've ever taken. Leverage it and use it to become successful. And that's my, my simple view on it. Precisely. To, just to add, add to what you're saying, Akhi Fawaz, you see, the, the attitude that you have towards these hardships and difficulties, first of all, it makes your story more interesting, just as you said. Like, who wants to hear the story of, yeah, so basically I started a business and, <laughs> and we made millions. Hmm. 
even Trump was handed down a million dollar check, but yeah. he still makes it interesting somehow. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's a million dollars back then, by the way. Back then, yeah. yeah. What's that? 17, still makes 18? it like I had struggles, I had this, I still makes right. it interesting. But subhanAllah, it reminds me of the hadith Qudusi, Ana inda dhanni abdi. Subhanallah. I am as my slave thinks I am. What's your thought of Allah? You know, whenever Allah tests me, and I'm going through something that on the surface it looks like a, oh man, you know, why? In my head straight away, I'm remembering this hadith. Ana inda dhanni abdi. What's your thought of Allah in that moment? Right. If you can train yourself, because the Prophet said, إِنَّمَا الصَّبْرُ عِنْدَ صَدْمَةِ الْأُولَى Verily, patience is at the first strike. So if you can train yourself to firstly and foremostly have patience in that first moment, and then after that, this is, Allah wants good for me. Allah loves me. Mm. He has a plan for me. Good things are ahead of me. Well, that's what's going to be for you, bro. Even if you can't see it in that moment. أَنَا عِنْدَ الظَّنِّ عَبْدِ That's why I said, bro, I don't know how these dons are, are, are getting by without Islam, أخي. You know, the power of this concept of good thoughts of Allah and tawheed and servitude of Allah Azza wa Jal. You know, if, if, like, when you, when you said earlier that always look at what the Prophet has gone through, because no doubt a Prophet has been through what you've been through. In fact, I feel like you can find a part of your story in every story, of, in, 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 every, in any story of any Prophet. Like, when Ibrahim alayhi salam was being thrown into the fire, Allah made the fire calm and peaceful for Ibrahim, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that would burn you. It's supposed to burn you. It's supposed to cause you extreme pain. Was calm and peace for Ibrahim. But that was due to his tawheed. Because what did he say before he was thrown in there? Just very quickly, I know watching these podcasts and these videos is really probably inspiring you to help take your business to the next level. And sometimes you can feel stuck not knowing exactly how to do that. If so, I wanted to show you how we've been doing that for some of our clients. Um, Brother Muni from Modern Muslim Man, he actually mentioned that after joining us, he increased his monthly income by 50%. Brother Isa, alhamdulillah, mentioned that had it not been for the lessons that he learned through the Righteous and Rich service that we provide, he wouldn't have been able to do his launch where he got over 60 people to sign up in about 24 hours, which is pretty phenomenal. Allah about it. Brother Fawaz, he actually sent me a message. He was a brother that I did some consultancy for. And may Allah reward him, he said that he sold out his program in record time twice by implementing two of the advices that I gave him, bringing in $40,000 in cash collected with an extra $20,000 that's about to come in, inshallah ta'ala, in subsequent days. These are just some of the examples of some of the wins that we're helping our brothers get through the services that we provide for them. Just to be clear, although the brothers, they thanked us and showed gratitude and appreciation, this was all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I showcase this with you because of course we live in a day and age where trust is at an all time low. And I want to be able to offer our services and our solutions to you so you can also make this type of money and see these type of successes as well. For that reason, I'm sharing this with you to earn your trust so that hopefully I can then earn your business so I can then serve you and my team can serve you. We've got two options. We've got the Righteous and Rich Skills Academy where we can teach you the skills and the training that you need to do it yourself and for your team where you have training and access to me and my team who can do live calls and help solve your problems on a pretty much daily basis except for twice a week and we've also got a service where we build out your funnels for you we can provide pretty much any marketing growth solution you need from building out funnels offers paid social media google ads seo we've teamed up with some of the most elite digital marketers in the entire world who provide these services on a global enterprise level to some of the biggest companies in the world and now they're going to be able to serve you that same level of service inshallah so before we get back to the discussion if you want to learn the skills and have the support from me and my team to help coach you along the way the righteous rich skills academy if you want us to help just build this stuff out for you then book a call with one of our team members inshallah to add and hopefully hopefully we can make this happen the second one requires just a heads up the second one is purely only for business owners and of course it does require a significant investment to be able to kind of you know have that type of service from us uh with that said let's get back to the discussion inshallah sorry guys as we're talking about Ibrahim Ali's time we realize some idols in the back unfortunately so usually we get rid of these and uh Wanted to just acknowledge that. <laughs> if you have seen it on the camera. If you saw it. <laughs> Anyways, inshallah. The point that I was mentioning was um, Ibrahim alayhi salam. He, uh, the fire became cool and peaceful for him, right? Mm -hmm. And the fire is a place that you expect to be burnt to shreds. Mm -hmm. In fact, they say the most painful thing a human can ever experience, as in the pinnacle of pain, is being burnt alive. So and the second, Allah. yeah, the second most painful thing is childbirth. Are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. In terms of just a known pain. fact. Like oh, known fact. Wow. Yeah, known fact, known fact. Um, like fire is the one thing that will actually 
it will cause you so much pain, it will, it will, it will destroy your pain receptors. Yeah, you understand? Akbar. So Ibrahim alayhi salam is being tossed into the fire and he's relaxing. Mm-hmm. Like, cool and peace. Like people don't feel that in their bedrooms, bro. Mm-hmm. A guy's in his a guy's in his he, he, his wife's in his arms, he's holding his kids. He doesn't feel cool and peaceful, bro. Yeah, Ibrahim's in a fire, cool and peaceful. And what was it? It was his connection to Allah. Has to be Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Allah is enough for me. And an excellent you know, dispose of my affairs. Mm. So if you have that relationship with your Lord, bro, mm. then you're going to find the fire in your life is also going to become cool and peaceful. Mm. You're going to find the difficult. And that's the thing, you know, being an entrepreneur is hard. Mm. But that's actually, it's actually hard. I, I stopped encouraging people to become entrepreneurs. You know that, right? Mm. Mm. I stopped that. Now I just work with people who already are entrepreneurs because it's actually uh, hard. Yeah, it's actually hard. It's, actually it's hard. not for everyone. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. Especially for the CEO. Mm. Especially for the leader. It's because, bro, it's like, you're responsible for everyone. You're responsible for your whole team. You're responsible for all your clients as well. The other day I was talking to a brother. I'm trying to get him as a client. And I said to him, okay, cool, inshallah. Uh, you know, I'm going to connect you to my guy, our, our, our sales guy. He's going to send you the contract. You know, he looked at me. He said to me, Ak, you can send me whoever. But as far as I'm concerned, it's you. Uh, just, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. He said, send me whoever, uh, no worries. Okay. But as far as I'm concerned, it's you. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, bro, it's, so, it's pressure. <laughs> yeah, it's pressure. It's pressure. <laughs> and then, bro, you know when you got to make payroll? I was, you know, I actually rate, <laughs> I actually rate the brother. You know, brother Harris. I've done a podcast with him, yeah? Yeah. The, the guy, you, you, yeah, yeah. you guys have all met him. He's a big man, alarm about it. He's doing his thing. Currently, he's running his business, mashallah, tabaraka. Contracts that he's, that he's signing, he told me, Contracts flying in weekly now for one of his companies, 100,000 each. Did I mean? That's 22, 23,000 pounds. Yeah, sure. He's getting multiple every week, weekly. You're right. Right? Mm. So the guy's making money, right? Alarm bed. So you know what he told me? I, he said to me, you know, a couple of months ago, like, I, 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 I didn't even have money like, to pay rent. Yeah. Allah. Okay. Yeah. Allah. He's, and, and I actually respect, like, Allah. just love how vulnerable he was. Like, he was so real because he gave me a chance to be vulnerable as well. Mm. And, and for me, to be honest, He's like, hey, you know this money? I'm, he goes, when, when, I, when, I, when I left that company in the UK and I moved to another Hijra, when I lost 2 million liquid, he goes, I just had a, some stock of bikes and I was selling those bikes to survive. Wow. And as I'm building my business, bro, like, I've got a team I need to hire, staff I need to pay. That's not coming in my pocket. Mm. That's not coming in my pocket. Mm-hmm. He goes, I'm putting that money back into the company. I live day to day. I live that, my day to day. Of course. He goes, even till now, I'm getting bikes mm-hmm. and I'm selling them. So I survived. Mm-hmm. My money's going back into the company. To, have, to be able to make those type of sacrifices, bro, like it's hard. Yeah. And then your kids are looking at you. Your wife's looking at you. Yeah. Your parents are calling you. Oh, they're hearing, oh, you, you got 100,000 contract, yeah? Yeah. But I... I but, 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 <laughs> not how it works. It's not how it works. <laughs> it's not how it works. Yeah, do you understand? Like, and you're like that duck, like come on the surface and underneath, like the ducks. And if you see how they swim, uh, like it's, it's their movie. Chaos, chaos man. Really? Okay. But when you see the duck, it's a sign of like peace. Calm. Oh, really? But bro, if you put the camera inside, that's and yeah, and yeah, that's exactly how it is. And it's it's chaos. It's chaos. That's exactly. Well, like, that's actually such a nice metaphor. Yeah, and the example of fire you use, man. When I used to tell, uh, when I was coaching guys to become entrepreneurs in real estate, I used to tell them, entrepreneur is like a firefighter. So now I'm going to use the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Okay. Because it's literally every day you're putting out fire. And you just have to become really good at it, especially when you're starting out as a startup entrepreneur, you don't know what the day is going to throw at you. So some people complain, man, then when am I going to do my work when I'm going to make money? Because all I'm doing is handling people's pain, being therapist to them. I said, well, you do it either 5 to 9, 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. or 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. That's when you do your work, like the working on the business. 9 to 5 is serving people. Yeah, because yeah, you are responsible for everyone. Oh. When I was in my office in, uh, in Warren in Michigan, now, of course, I moved to Dubai, I had an open door policy. Like, literally, you could just walk into my door and, and, uh, and, and speak to me. Now, the person, the brother, he's, he's doing much better now. The person that I put him in my, in, in my position, he's like, bro, these people just come because it's an agency. And people go through problem. It's a high voltage sales agent. There's always pains, deals falling apart. You know, agents, they spend the money when they earn the commission, not when it hits the bank account. Meaning, mm. I got Brother Imran under contract. My commission will be $30,000. Will be, right? I already start spending on that. 
even though I'm going to get paid, let's say, a month later when he closes on the house. But I'm already spending on my credit card, mm -hmm. thinking that, of course, it's going to close in a month. Let me get my suit. Let me do this. Let me do that. Let me pay all my expenses. But for whatever reason, Qadrullah, let's say the deal doesn't close. Oh, my days, bro. Bro. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem with agency culture. For the even of these credit cards. Yeah. Man. And sometimes as a leader, you got to play the role of a therapist. Bro, you know my, my business partner, Abdul Rahman. Yeah. Just, 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 no, no, no. Go ahead. He has, he's like, he has a rule. He's like, bro. It's not real until we spend it. Mm. At <laughs> least. But that's that's the rule. He sounds like Abu Bakr. Bro, yeah. He sounds like Abu Bakr. We don't need to spend all of it. Yeah. But until I have bought something with it, it's not real, bro. Yes. I don't care about pending transaction. Yeah. I don't care about invoices cleared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Until I bought something, it's not real. That's yeah. like Abu Bakr. Right? So, pro profits aren't profits that are realized. Say that again. Pro profits aren't profits that are realized. Throw it up. If they're yeah. actually there, you can't, Throw it up. can't spend on money that's supposed to come in. That's why I was smiling when you were saying that, because yeah. I know that feeling, bro. And that's a yeah. discipline very hard to build for up-and-coming entrepreneurs. 100%. Yeah. No, I'll take it, take it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think... I was one, waiting for that synergy to start, yeah, you know? So, one, yeah. thing, one thing people do need to consider when it comes to, like, the whole entrepreneurship side and dealing with the problems, etc., it's, it's actually something that's studied and learned how to, like, deal with emotional, like, distress, like, how to perform mm. even with emotions, etc., See, I've noticed a big problem with entrepreneurs. They have too much entropy, like things that are distracting them and taking them away and destroying their lives from like becoming you know, the best entrepreneur he can be. If you do not learn how to perform under high pressure, you can't actually scale. It's impossible, right? You have to learn to a certain degree how to make effective, good decisions while being like under pressure, right? It's just like, like you said, firefighters, right? Again, it's high. Some people could die. They're going into a burning building, but they have to make... There's no, oh, the burning was building. I made the wrong decision. Someone no. dies because of that. It's Being an entrepreneur, it's, it's quite similar. If you make a bad decision, your whole business could very likely burn or you could make take a big L. Now, of course, nothing you couldn't build back. It's not the same as losing a life, of course, but you have to be able to make good decisions even under high duress. I just want to mention, you know, when we're talking about entrepreneurs, right? I feel like this and this everything that we're saying can also apply to people that are in the da'wah. Mm -hmm. I don't mean this champagne da'wah or this TikTok da'wah. Tell me, what is TikTok da'wah? Yeah. Like genuine? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just like a young act just starts making videos mm. to get views. I'm not going to his heart. I'm not talking about anyone specific, but yeah. it's the concept of, yeah. you know, they don't really have any other skill other than they know some ayat, right. some ahadith. Sometimes they don't even know ayat and ahadith yeah. and they just... They have good intentions and then whatever. But my point is, I'm talking about real da'wah. Like, you know, when you're in the trenches, you're actually like, calling to Allah. You're talking to people. If you're saying, because it's hard, bro. Like, the same way business is hard. And that's what these are my, these are my two favorite people in the world. A, a, a student of knowledge that gives da'wah and a righteous entrepreneur. Mm. Because both are serving um. Like, both, like, the, 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 the student of knowledge is actually helping people with regards to their deen. The entrepreneur is providing solutions in terms of their life. That is one brother I came across him. I was speaking to him yesterday. I was actually mind blown. Uh, you guys may have seen him. I think on Instagram, his name is Azim Fitness. The brother Allah, hopefully I got his name wrong. Maybe people can check him out. The brother Allah overcame diabetes. Lord, what? Wow. wham! Yeah? And he overcame diabetes. And now he helps clients overcome diabetes and get in shape. That's wow. big. But I thought I had that. What a pain he's solving. Yeah, because like, he's not going to be up there on lights. He might not be mentioned in, 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 in the history books as, you know, one of the greatest leaders. But bro, what you don't understand is that it's not about whether your name is mentioned or not. Look at the service you're providing. Like you're serving slaves of Allah. Like, my parents are diabetic. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm. My dad had a heart attack because of his diabetes. Mm. But like, you're actually out here mm. helping Muslims like, overcome that. You're helping them get back strong. Yeah. And it may be that. Dad is going to have a few more years be able to raise his kid who's going to go on to become some great guy. Mm -hmm. Like, bro, you're serving the ummah. You know what I'm saying? The, the Prophet said the best uh, believer is the one who's most beneficial to mankind, right? Beneficial. So, so, so that's why for me, the students don't always give that one. Mm -hmm. The un righteous entrepreneur. They're the two best people. Mm -hmm. They're the two best people, two best categories that serve yeah. this, 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 this deen and this ummah. So everything that we're saying here applies to both. It applies to both. Um, all right, listen, let me, let me throw something at you guys, yeah? You talked about this thing, Fawaz, of um, being able to, you must be able to perform whilst under high pressure. But have you guys ever felt that feeling sometimes when 
the situation is so intense that it's like like in Arabic they call it you know الضغط mm-hmm. the pressure like, you know and sometimes there's دغوط there's pressures yeah and it's and sometimes it actually feels I don't know I felt like this before I'm not sure if you guys can relate but it feels like your chest is actually like actually has a weight yeah and sometimes you struggle to breathe like panic attacks not panic attack but yeah maybe one could say you know in that trajectory but it's like you're struggling to just breathe like you're just taking shallow breaths and you're just trying to think and focus but your mind is just hazy mm. and in that situation how does one then go above water catch a breath and then have clarity and make a decision it's a beautiful one I think one thing you have to realize is systems cannot operate independent of the environment as well. Okay. No matter how amazing your inputs, your processes are, you're not going to get the output unless you're in the right environment in order to get the output. Right. For example, um, let's say I have the best ingredients, have the best materials. I know exactly how to bake the cake. If I can't get the temperature right in the oven, it's not going to be a cake, right? It's not going to be a very good cake. A lot of entrepreneurs don't take into consideration their environment when they're trying to build. Meaning what? Sometimes you're in a high stress environment where loads of people are putting pressure on you. They're saying things to you, etc. You have to be able to sometimes get out of the environment mm. to have sort of like a healthy escape. Now, I don't believe in the form of like escapism, running away every time, but somewhere where you can go. The Prophet him, as we know, he used to go to what the cave, all right? He used to go to the cave, spend some time as well. Every entrepreneur needs a thing he goes to in order to like, sort of when he closes the door, mm. the door is closed, right? He puts everything behind and he's able to focus on what matters. It's sort of where he builds his game plan. He strategizes again, all right? Another important thing is just, again, build your resilience is a big thing yeah. that entrepreneurs don't do. Time, it, it... Ex- your resilience is like how well, of course, you deal with issues and, you know, persevere over problems, etc. So things like cold showers, again, it helps perseverance, right? Hot, cold um, therapy, again, helps perseverance. So gym, again, that's why there's actually a statement by Alex Hormozzi. He, he was actually factual. He said, name me a field in which men who know how to make money and men who are physically fit don't beat everyone else in. Like if you take that type of people, Name me two other things you can put for other people and they don't beat them. Of course, he forgot the concept of Islam because they're careful. But the point of what I'm trying to establish is if you are taking care of your body and that's the beautiful thing about gym, it builds resilience also. Mm. So the more things you do to build resilience, right, the more you will be able, because what you're mentioning is actually like no matter how strong your mind is, your body is always going to be a limitation. So even when you think you can run 10 kilometers, perhaps your body wants to stop at six, but you can really go to eight, right? So you have to train your body as well to keep up with your mind by training the body. Mm. And this is why people need to physically train themselves to get the resilience. And you'll see it helps with the chest issues. I had a client who was particularly dealing with that, like in a high sense, right? He'd get like really tired, you know, his people are complaining to him. His wife is a bit of a naggy one as well. And he just, he, he had the big issue with it. Wallah al until I try the cold showers, we did some hot cold therapy as well with him. We got him as well to start like going to the gym, lifting heavy things, going, running, jogging in the cold. He's building resilience. Again, wallah al straight away he came back to me. He goes, bro, what you did was crazy. Yeah, I mean, um, what, see, the whole cold shower thing gets laughed at a lot by a lot of these, uh, the likes of Andrew Tate and whatnot. But actually, the points there that Fawaz has just mentioned is very important, and I'll tell you why it's very important. You're going to get tested with major calamities in your life, whether you like it or not. And the thing with these tests is, it's going to be something that you didn't anticipate, big man. You do not have the answers for, and that's why you're being tested with that in the first place, because this dunya is a revealer. It's a revealer of who you really are. That's why you, the, the eye you mentioned in Surah Ankabut. To see, Yanni, are you really, are you really believe? So putting yourself through these minor uh, stress, uh, stresses on a daily basis starts building that muscle of being able to tolerate the major stresses mm. that are about to come. And if you build up this tolerance, when that major stressor does present itself, you will be better equipped to deal with it. I'm not going to say it's going to be easy, but you will be better equipped to deal with it. 
culture I was working out daily. I mentioned to you on a podcast we've done before that I know when my mind is, the, the resilience of my mind is slipping, when the condition of my body is slipping. Mm. There is a direct correlation between my body fat going up and something's going off in, in my life and, my, and the resilience of my mind is, mm. is off point again. I use my literal body composition as an indicator of what's going on up here. That's the first thing. The second thing after that, it goes back to what we were talking about just half an hour ago. <laughs> I'm as my slave thinks I am. And it, uh, we've all been, been through tests here. I've been through tests that I didn't anticipate or expect to go through. I had to bur bury a son. I've lost access to other children. I lost my business. I did not expect or anticipate any of those things to happen. But I know that as Allah will continue to test me in the future, and he will, you start rolling with the punches a little bit. You know, it's like, it's just going to be okay, man. Like a disaster happens. It's going to be okay, alhamdulillah. Like we're going to be okay. Allah loves me. This is my thought of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He loves me and he wants good for me. Therefore, this thing is not actually a bad thing. It's a bridge to something better, which I can't access until I navigate this stressor that Allah has presented to me to begin with. I agree, man. Pressure is privilege. And I think uh, what wow. separates highest... I should say that again. That's actually... That's... Yeah. Pressure is privilege. And, uh, and I, it's, I think it's even a privilege to be able to... Yeah, it's a privilege. Just acknowledge that. Yeah, 100%, Sheikh. And Allah only... And we know Allah only burdens the soul what they can bear, right? So if Allah is burdening more on you, you're privileged, right? So pressure is a privilege. And what separates high achievers from others is literally one thing. High achievers do what they're supposed to do regardless of how they feel. Mm -hmm. And others would only do the days they feel good about it. The days mm -hmm. the sun is rising, you know, it's not raining, everything is aligning, they had a good breakfast, the <laughs> wife was good to them, everything is great, that's the day they'll make the calls, right? But high achievers would do it regardless of how they feel. So how do they build this discipline? For me, Sheikh, I can only talk about me personally, it's two things. When life hits you hard, you gotta hit the masjid harder and the gym harder. Oh, and wow. I 100% agree with Brother Fawaz and Mahdi, because your mind cannot control your body, but your body can control your mind. Mm -hmm. So if your mind cannot control your body, but your body... Yeah, like the example of running he used. Like from my mind, yes, I'm so strong, I can run 10 kilometers. But if it's not supported by the body, I cannot do it. But if my body is strong, mm. it's going to force my mind to do things. It's very interesting because, truth be told, whenever difficulties mm. or calamities start striking, or things, you know, start getting intense. In my mind, I drop gym mm. to focus on it. In my mind, I'm like, you know what? The hour and a half it take me to get there, work out, come back. I, sh I could use that here. But you, you're saying that that's bad. That's bad. And I think both brothers can add on. But for me, you need to like go extra. That day when you feel like that, you need to lift heavier, run heavier, torture the hell out of yourself. Because when you go through that process, Sheikh, whatever you're trying to think, you're stuck because you're, you're putting yourself in a corner. But when you go out there, move your body, the blood starts flowing, mm. you start thinking better, you start processing things better. And of course, you being you, you're, you're doing zikr along with the gym and everything else that you're doing while working out, 100% you're going to see a difference. And I think both brothers can add more to it. Yeah, I think entrepreneurs think putting myself in front of the problem as much as possible fixes the problem. Sometimes you need to get away from the problem in order to fix the problem, mm. right? So sometimes the best thing to do is to focus on everything but the problem itself. And naturally you'll be like, you know, you might just be lifting up the dumbbell and you're like, I got the breakthrough. Mm. You, 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 know, you, know, you, you know, I I, would, I can really attest to that. Re recently, things got a bit hard in terms of, um, in terms of business, yeah? Mm. We currently, alhamdulillah, just kind of spread ourselves too thin in terms of trying to hire the best talent. Because mm. I got sick and tired of just working with people that are just low quality. Yeah. So I was like, you know what? We're hiring tens. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's you that went to my head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, 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 but mashallah, tabarakallah, you know, team is solid right now. But then obviously you have to make sure that, like we, 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 we basically overestimated our 
our projections mm-hmm. in terms of what the cash flow would be like, right? Yeah. So things got a bit tight. Tight. And whenever that happens, I I always take it deep because at the end of the day, bro, people have got bills to pay. Mm. You know what I'm saying? You have to make sure that come the first, mm. like everyone's wife is going to be waiting for their nafaka. They're going to be waiting for the. You know what I'm saying? People got kids. They're sending the kids to school, mm. and it's just it's just it's just not a nice feeling, you know? Yeah. So we it was it was it was very stressful, and I, I honestly believe Allah has really tested me in this moment because we had we had. So many opportunities, but things were just stuck. Like it, they weren't moving. And um, the uh, what was needed was so high. Like it was such a big mountain. And we were so far away from it. And the deadline was like literally around the corner. And I was literally feeling that way that you guys just, you know, that way I described. Mm. Like that, that feeling of like, you know, the heart is just, the, the chest feels like there's a weight on it. Yeah. And I remember about, it was about two, three hours. I was just trying to work and I couldn't mm-hmm. and, I, and I literally sat there for two, three hours just doing shadow tasks not being able to focus mm. and um, it was in that time Alhamdulillah when I was going through that I solidified a routine of spending between Maghrib to Ishat in the masjid mm. and that's why when you said hit the masjid hard I really resonated with that because and the fact that you mentioned that get away from the problem but it would just calm me down hmm. in a way that would just have, I'd have a relaxed mind. Hmm. And um, the baraka from that, when I, things would just start happening, when I'm not even doing the work, like things would just start happening hmm. behind the scenes. The team messaged me, oh, we just did this, we just did that, we just sorted this out, that got sorted out. And just the power of like dua, man, and the baraka of the Quran. So, I I I I realized that subhanAllah that that time, like that time in the masjid, I feel like it's it's a wajib, man, for people that live high stress lives. Interesting. But now I'm gonna add gym to that as well, inshallah. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna visually re- represent because uh, I don't want to point that if I was meant to get lost on the people, uh-huh. yeah, of getting away from the problem. Uh-huh. Right, close your eyes for a second. Okay. Okay. Open your eyes. Can you see what's written? No. Wow. Now can you see it? Oh wow. Yeah. yeah. What happened there? Yeah, wow. You got away from the, away problem. From the problem. Sometimes we are just wow. too close to it. Yeah. <laughs> Did you get it? Oh, that's wow. a good one, man. Oh. See, cl- yeah. clarity is the greatest weapon of an entrepreneur and of any man. What you can do when your mind is clear is completely different when your mind is clogged. Oof. And, you know, people respect people. Oh. Men respect men who are clear in their vision. Mm. Exactly what they want. You know, when I'm talking to you brothers, the reason like it excites me and I look forward to the next one is because you're clear. You're exactly clear where you want to go. You're exactly clear. You're exactly clear. Now, if you talk to brothers and we're all in that situation at one point, I don't know, man, I'm confused, man. I'm so tired, irritating. man. I'm like, okay, stay confused, stay tired. So, so <laughs> irritating to be around, honestly. Seriously. So irritating. P- people who aren't clear are the most irritating people to be around. Yeah. just can't stand them. Like, 100% always, agree. Yeah, like if choose something, do something, but don't just... Yeah, I think a lot of people just stare and just like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're waiting for something. And I'm yeah. like, again, nobody's coming to save you, bro. Like, they're using social media and games. Yeah, this, this they is, don't get time to the, think. The escapism uh, podcast we actually did, the, the reason why I blew, especially for entrepreneurs, imagine entrepreneurs were coming to me saying, that was the sickest thing you've ever did, right? It's because we look for forms of escapism. So we're working on our business. We're doing nothing. Mm. Like, why are you designing this stupid graphic or changing these? That's not your job, mm. right? That's an EA's job. That's not you. Okay. You're supposed to be what? Focusing on the highest leverage things that drive the business forward. But you're like, no, I was productive. I stood in front of my desk for six hours, but the problem isn't being solved. That's not what you're supposed to be doing for these six hours. You're, you've wasted six hours. It was actually better for you to go to the beach and swim and then go to the masjid after. It would have been better for you than to work for those six hours. Because mm. at least, again, you're giving the mind clarity, direction, mm. right? It's being in front of something too much, it just makes you hate that. Mm. Even with people. You spend too much time with people, or- you get sick and I'm just like, yeah, bro, let, let's say salams in it, yeah. right? That's why it's good to leave space between each other. Same thing with the problem. Sometimes leave space between you and the issue. When you come back, you're going to destroy it. You know, I used to do a thing, you know, Mohammed used to attack me for it, right? Um, whenever we'd be going through like, uh, you know, a deep issue, I'd be like, yeah, bro, I'm going horse riding. 
<laughs> I used to be like, bro, the company is falling apart. We're going for X, Y, Z. They go, I guess, what do you want me to do? Sit down and stare at my computer until something comes. Then as I'm on the horse, you know, I relax. Again, we up there. I bet that always it's like, oh, you know what? You, you know, I just deep. Now, I'm, as you're saying this, I'm actually reflecting because I don't do this actively, to be honest. Mm. I don't do it actively. But um, times when things have been hard, where I just got away, were actually the times where we're able to solve the problems. Mm. That's deep. I actually, I'm just deep in it right now. Because my, 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 my mindset is, bro, well, if it's going off, yeah. I have to get it cracking. Mm. That's deep. Get away from it. It's what you escape to, I think, that's important. Mm. You know? Escape to Don't Allah. Don't lose work as escape. Or escape to the escape gym. Escape to Allah. Again, <laughs> it's, it's when you, you look at the statement of, uh, subhanAllah, um, the father of Yusuf, yeah, yep. Hulku, yep. and he said, what does he say? He says, all of my complaints, my dear, it's just for Allah. Mm. I only go to Allah. So for me, when you have an entrepreneur, like he said, just hey, so you would work on yourself, take time, breathe. Mm. You know, breathing is actually so important. People actually don't breathe right. Mm. And that's, that's why they go for it. We get wired to mm. want to work around the clock. Mm. Uh, like I have a problem of pressing the off button. Salah, mm. if I'm perfectly honest. The only way I can truly switch the off button is if I'm doing my memorization, my Quran, Quran memorization, because I have to focus, or if I'm in the gym. Other than that, it's a struggle to switch that off button. You know, to, to quote you, you guys mentioned Alex Formosi. He mentioned one of his shorts that I really resonated with. He said, people keep asking, what's the, what, what, what tool do I need to add to my arsenal to become a, a successful entrepreneur or businessman? He's like, well, you don't, this is his, just his opinion. You know? He's like, what you don't realize is that successful entrepreneurs and businessmen don't have something additional. They are lacking in something. Mm. And that is, they don't have an off button. Bro, that hit me different. Like, we don't have an off button. And that's why, to, to go back to what Fawaz was saying, as I did that example with you, mm. you have to get away from the problem sometimes. You're too close to it. Mm. It's in front of you. The answer's there, but it's too close. The vision is blurred. We need some distance to get that clarity. Mm. Yeah. And I think just quickly, Chef, one from the story that you mentioned, like your businesses, and it's, it's very important for entrepreneurs to know, like the payrolls coming and you are so close in closing some deals, but there's welcome to entrepreneurship, <laughs> right? So this is, we have to build a muscle of the long play. Mm. Like I still like subhanAllah, it's the funniest thing. And we laugh about it. So you know how we always write down, okay, this check is coming. This check is, especially when you're starting out and I'm going to do this with that. So the year I was getting married, I'm not going to mention his name. Let's call him Mr. X. I wrote Mr. X on my notebook and I'm going to pay, get paid $7,000 from him when he buys this house. Okay. Mm. And I really literally put it on my notebook and next to it, I put what am I going to spend it on? Cause that's the year I was getting married. Right. Bro, it's been eight years. He hasn't paid you. No, I still have not made any money from him, but that's seven. He's still my client though. Like wow. customer. And that 7,000 though keeps increasing. Now I'm expecting a paycheck of $300,000 when he closes on what I'm expecting him to close on. Maybe he will not close on this too. He's a great brother, but always gets a cold feed. He wants to do something else. We keep nurturing him. We keep doing things. Oh, but the... eight years, we did not close. We're so close on closing on him in the year 2015. It's 2020, actually nine years now. I still have not made any money from him. And that's just one example. So there will be so many times. We're so close, like the sales call went great. Yes, yeah, send me the credit card link. Boom, done. <laughs> Never happens. And it might not happen for the next eight years. So how do you, you know, still sustain in that position? And one thing just from the business side of things, I think a huge pipeline. So it can't be that one guy I'm waiting on. Mm. Just, just, it has to be hundred guys. It has to be 200. It has to be thousand. Pipeline solves all problems. In agency business, I always tell people, recruiting solves all problems. Mm. Keep recruiting agents. It's going to fix all. If you don't understand anything about business in agency business, just keep recruiting, keep recruiting more agents, more agents, more agents. Because it will they just will solve. go out there and get more leads. Exactly. Get more leads, work. If somebody leaves, they're replacing and new agents come and teach you what you're lacking. Your leadership improves, like recruiting is going to solve. It's actually nice because, I mean, when we met in, I think like January, you had like 200 agents. Yes. Yeah. And then we spoke a few months after you had like 250. Yep. Then it went down. It goes up because Sheikh. Another thing about agency business, and we can do a whole podcast on agency business, and there's this great book. The guy runs one of the, of course, like he runs a talent agency in Hollywood. Okay. okay. But the principles, the fundamentals are the same in agency, which is what are your 
essentially doing? You're making someone from zero to literal hero so that he can go out and open up another agency of his own mm. and compete with you. Mm -hmm. That's the model of an agency. Mm -hmm. Wow. Literally, you're creating your competition. Interesting. Oh, wow. Any agency, think about it. So if I'm, if I'm the owner of the largest real estate agency and all of these largest real estate agencies in Dubai or in America, anywhere, for example, one of the largest, uh, Keller Williams, okay, Gary Keller is the founder. He was part of another brokerage. He learned everything from there, opened the largest um, brokerage. Then from his brokerage, another guy named, I think, uh, some Gary Sanford or something, he went out and opened up EXP. So all of these guys would learn and then go. So you're empowering them to open up their own agency. So that business, if you're not doing it right, you're constantly going to be in that, in that circle of like producing competition. So it's not an easy business to be part of. Mm. So you have to have major pipeline and you have to have the ascension. Like you're not only making money from the agency, you're upselling them on other things. Mm. And that's how you retain the big network. The abundance mindset comes from having a, an abundance. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Abundance of a pipeline in, the, in this example here. Yeah, Sheikh. Like, for example, like all these lot of agents from our agency went out and opened up their own brokerages. Mm -hmm. And some of their, you know, there are two types of competition. One is I'm going to wake up same time as Brother Fawaz. I'm going to dominate the world. I'm going to conquer the world, right? I'm going to dominate this industry. Another type of competition, I'm going to wake up. And I'll make sure I'll do everything possible to distract Fawaz from domination. Mm. And that's the dangerous type of competition, right? So some of the brothers that went out and opened up their own agency, we're going to conquer the world. We respect Sam for what he has done for us. Great. Now I'm going to conquer the world. It's my time. Great, man. Awesome. Some of them went and opened up. Our goal is to bring Sam Amin down, just to show him what time is it now. And, the, and, and you they were part of the agency. Yes. They learned everything from here. They became heroes there. For whatever reason, they feel jealous. They feel I'm too ahead. Like the... Were you offended? No, Sheikh. So when they do that, I changed the field on them. So they... <laughs> they wanna, don't, they're, give, don't give away too many secrets, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so they're in the... Let's say they show up in this field. Like they show up in English Premier League. They want to beat Cristiano Ronaldo and show him what time is it. The guy switches the league on you. Yeah. He's not even playing in that league anymore. Mm. So what are you going to do now? How you, how you beat him? He's not even in your league. So you, as a leader, have to constantly create your own league. Mm. Now I'm in Dubai sitting with Brother Dao, man. Mahdi Tijani, Brother Fawaz. It's a new league, man. I think, Sam, Sam you know, when you, yeah. when you say it, you say it with so much conviction, I can tell you actually live it, man. Mm. <laughs> no, alhamdulillah, seriously, seriously, brother. And, and actually, I actually believe you when you say you weren't offended. You're like, I just uh, No, and oh, what yeah. they see now I'm doing, they have no idea what's about to come, inshallah. Mm. Yeah, that's the thing. You know when people copy you, but digressing a bit. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. But when they copy you, it's like... They're they, years behind already. They, yeah, yeah. They just copy what they see on the surface, bro. You don't know what we've been cooking for the last six months. Exactly. Yeah, bro. Because what you don't you even see know on the surface yeah. was already cooked three years ago. Yes, bro. So you're three years behind, actually, if you're copying what I'm doing now. Hard. I planned for it three years ago. Hard. Okay, so I wanna. We've got about 15 minutes left, inshallah. I'm gonna bring it back to the whole. Out of barakah in time, man. Yeah, alhamdulillah. You know what, guys? I should really That's enjoy this, amazing. Man. I don't know. I don't know what the people are going to say in the comments. I'm just going I'm just, I'm just to. We're just chilling here. I'm just going to call the elephant out in the room. I think we should. We should make this a, a four man thing, you know, for as long as possible. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I, yeah. Faz is local, and Brother Mahdi is local. I'm done. Yeah, I'm done. Is not, but we're trying to make him local. Oh, you're not, bro. Oh. So you're in the you're in the I'll, same boat as Brother Mahdi. That's bougie. Yeah, that's in bougie, but it's a slow boy. Honestly, I think it will be beneficial for people. Like, just yeah. honestly, inshallah. Anyways, um, that's actually my plan, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to test it out today and see if it was good, I was yeah. kind of a spot and say, let's do this more often. Yeah, <laughs> let's roll an event If you've first. got questions that you would like answered on another question, on, yeah. another, on another podcast, put it in the comments. Because you, you know, a, a discussion I think would be so important to have is what type of a wife should an entrepreneur, Muslim entrepreneur pick? Mm. And I believe it's the same type of wife that a daddy or student knowledge should pick. Which is? But that's a podcast. Uh, <laughs> what a cliffhanger. But I, 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 can, I can answer you quickly. Yeah. It's either a Khadija or an Aisha. Oh. What does that mean? Yeah. Khadija is one who's going to just support you unconditionally. Yeah. Her, she's just going to be there to just, my man, go out there and kill it. Ooh. And the Aisha is the one who's going to actually do the work with you. Like Aisha, they are spread the knowledge of the Prophet. Yeah. And Khadija supported the Prophet. So Aisha, they took the knowledge and spread it. So the origin of the wife is actually going to 
mm. do the grind with you. Mm. She's going to do the da'wah with you or she's going to be a part of the business with you. Yeah, behind the scenes, yep. She needs a Khadija or an Aisha. Do you have any less than that? She needs to go. But anyway, <laughs> don't take my statement. I'm restricting you. But I'll be honest, man. You know what I mean? Sorry, there's a reason why I said that. You know, if you look at Surah Al-Azab, we're digressing. This should be a part of Islam. But in Surah Al-Azab, when Allah talks to the wives of the Prophet, Allah says, لَسْتُنَّكَ أَحْدٍ مِنْ نِسَاءٍ You're not like other women. You're the wives of the Prophet. You, you have to have different standards. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you want the dunya, then you can go. Yeah. But if you want to be with the Prophet, if you want to be with this man who's changing the world, mm. you've, got, you've got to come correct. Yeah. Anyway, that's, that's the discussion. So let us know in the comments what discussions you would like. Yes. Ask Brother Mahdi questions and he will honor us with his presence. Okay, look, I want to bring it back to um, one final point. Maybe we can conclude, conclude on this. I just want to hear what you guys, what you guys' thoughts are on this and how we can kind of, if you can relate, yeah. if, you, if you have any, 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 anything to add. I find that the Sahaba had a had a very strong mind, man. Mm. And I want to mention two examples. Amar ibn Yasir, the, the, the young Sahabi that I mentioned who saw his parents be killed in front of him. When he came to Medina, yeah. the Prophet, when he saw him, he said, Wayha Ammar. The Prophet said, Whoa, Ya Ammar. He's going to be killed by the rebellious group. So he knew he was going to die. And the prophet, because the prophet told you you're going to be killed by a rebellious group. That you've been told you're going to die now. Mm. It's going to happen. Like the prophet said it. So it's, it's, yeah. it's revelation. Yeah. You're going to die and you're going to be killed by a rebellious group. Mm. Yet, when you look at his life, when you look at his biography, it doesn't seem like a guy who's like timid. Timid. Or, or my goodness, the world is going to kill me. <laughs> Reluctant to go out. You see him on the front of the battlefield, every battle he's there. Right? He doesn't have the psychological profile of a person who's like, wait, I'm going to be cured. Mm. Likewise, Uthman عن, and Umar, when the Prophet was on the mountain, he said to the mountain of Uhud, he said, stand firm, for upon you stands a prophet, a truthful man, a Bakr and two martyrs. Mm. Umar and Uthman knew they were going to be killed, bro. Yeah. They knew they were going to be killed. Allah. And they lived every day, grabbing a bull by the horns, at the front, on the front row of the prayer, at the front row in the battlefield. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Um, they didn't live like people who were like, oh, we're going to die. But that's, that's, that's uh, my, my sheikh from Egypt. He's, he, when he mentioned this to me, he was like, we're the opposite today. Because this is the touchscreen generation. Because mm. mm. you know, you touch and they break. He said, he says, he, because you just tap them and they break. He goes, Sahaba, they were different. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So, yeah, what, are you, what are you guys' thoughts on that, man? They're going to go first. <laughs> Mahdi, I think he has something to say because he was he was he was reacting to the story live. <laughs> I felt that it's synergy. Yeah, bro, it's uh, it's a, it's a sign of the times. It sounds like a cliche, stale statement, but it's not in that. And this is what I'm going back to you saying earlier, if it was. But we live in a very comfortable environment in the in the West or in the Middle East, for that matter. But yeah, for the most part, the majority of the viewers here watching, although you might feel like you're uncomfortable or whatever, the truth of the matter is, like you have access to amenities that kings of the past didn't have access to, right. like flushing your toilet, big man, or turning a tap and water coming out, okay? So we live in a time, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, whereby things are comfortable, mm. but there's a cost to that. There's a price to be paid for that. And the price to be paid for that is the touchscreen generation, like uh, your sheikh mentioned. The resilience of your mind. You have to go out of your way mm. to do things to maintain some type of uh, structural integrity of your mind. Mm. You, like, I can't, Im to be honest with you, like, if I were to imagine the companions of the Allah Anhu Jami'an, I can't imagine them doing cold showers and baths and things like this because bro, their life was just hard. <laughs> yeah. You understand? They needed the opposite, ease and softness wherever they could get it. <laughs> with us, it's the opposite. This is why even if you look at testosterone levels, testosterone levels are dropping dramatically. Every, I was speaking to a doctor yesterday, he's like, every few years, they release new standards and the, and the averages come down. So he said, I literally, as I was telling a patient, wow. I said, I was telling a patient the other week or the other month, I can't remember, uh, that, you're, uh, that you're actually in the low, you're below the low range. He said, now I, if I have another patient who comes with the same okay. levels, he said, I can't tell him that you're in the low, you're still- The bar just average. keeps getting low. Because the bar came down again. Oh, so And this is multifactorial. There's many reasons for this, from the foods that we eat, to the plastics in our environment, to the water that we, can, that we drink. It's multifactorial. The bottom line is, Alhamdulillah, we live comfortable lives for the most part. Therefore, we now have to actually go out of our way 
to find discomfort so that we can maintain that structural integrity of the mind. Big time, Wale. That's what, you know, coming back to the whole point about um, cold showers and, um, and like cold plunges. That's, that's exactly why I started doing it. I remember me and Abubakar, we were, we were going. I, I, I went the first week and then he heard about it. He was like, I want to come. So he watched one of the Andrew Huberman podcasts, health sides and the health benefits. So he was telling me, I'm going to do five minutes. I heard it's not good to do more than this, that. Yeah. I said, brother, I don't care about any of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, not, I'm not coming here for no health. Like, yeah, don't go talk. through the hardship. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I I, yeah, I was, I'm only here to exercise my brain. I yeah. hear it. That's the only reason I'm here. He was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Andrew Huberman got another one still yeah. about resilience in terms of cold plunges. So he watched that. And yeah, that's, that's what I'm sure that it health benefits and yeah. stuff like that. But that doesn't really concern me as right, much as right. just put my brain through that suffering. Yeah. Even come back to the gym thing. Well, like, you know, that concept of training to failure. Like you yeah. do not realize how much you actually have in you to you do. I remember Umar would always, he was, he's, he's my personal trainer in case anyone was wondering. He would always tell me, ah, oh, that wasn't a failure. That was a joke. I was like, what do you mean I'm smoked? Yeah, right. I can't, he said, I'm telling you, I have three, four in you. And then just, I don't know, just, okay, it, it, was, it was such a blessing from Allah. He was there to actually kind of push me through it. Of course. But he made me actually understand, bro, I have so much more. Yeah. And I remember there was one time, Ahi, where on the first set, I think I gave up on like, Nine reps. Mm. And he was like, I'm telling you, you had yeah. more. And I remember that was the moment where I realized, I was like, you know what, you know what I'm just going to do? I'm just going to affirm it. I had done 15 reps in the next set. Wow. Of, of the same weight. Wow. Right? I was like, what? Yeah. Second set as well. Mm. And, it's, and now it's just, when I approach it, it's like, oh, I already know I can do more. Like when you start getting to that painful point, you're like, I actually saw a video of Muhammad Ali. He said, they asked him, um, how many sit-ups do you do? He goes, I don't know. I only count when it starts to hurt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that. That's mad, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, I only count when it starts to hurt. Because that builds that mindset of, bro, the warrior mindset. I can do more. Yeah. 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 I think what you have to understand is that has a spillover effect. And this is what people underestimate. That pain you feel in the gym, understanding that and you've now got that, like, profound understanding that whenever I think I can't go anymore, I actually can. That spills over like subconsciously in business, in family as well. It's like, oh, I'm but I actually can do more. So that's the beautiful thing. There's a spillover effect. This is the problem. Everyone's been separating every aspect of our lives. It's all a system. We're all one big system. It's just like a car. A steering wheel has system, has certain inputs, processes, and outputs. That's the steering wheel. But if you look at a car holistically, there's loads of mini systems that make that big system, that one functioning car. When you start to look at yourself like this, that's why you start to care about optimizing and removing as much entropy as possible from every area of your life because mm. every area affects the other area. And that's why people need to start looking at things holistically. Like for a man, and I'm glad that Brother Mehdi said that, right? For a man who doesn't have warm water, cold showers isn't something that is, helps his resilience. Yeah. Does that make sense? You have to find something. I always tell people, you should do a healthy amount of things you don't enjoy in life. Just as a man, you have to get used to doing a healthy amount of things that you genuinely don't like and don't enjoy. Because if you only train your mind to do the things you like and eat the things you like, and you get this fairy lifestyle. Like, you know, I went to one of the, we, we went out, you know, a brother, and then there was a bit of lettuce in his bag and he told the waiter before no lettuce. And so what does he do? He says, can you make me another one, but just remove that? I'm like, bro, just remove the lettuce yourself. Worst case scenario. And I don't know why you're acting like a fairy. You can't eat lettuce, but I'll ask you, Annie, just remove the lettuce. Because no, there's a flavor in the burger. It re and wow. like, it's, it's not abnormal in society it. today. Does that make yeah. sense? Like, that's not, that's not, <laughs> like, bro, I'm trying to sit here and think, like, imagine, like, Allah tests him of something, like, where there's little food. What, what? Lettuce is your biggest issue. So you have, there's three kinds of ways to put yourself through complexity. Either it's self-inflicted, meaning you've put yourself intentionally in that position, right? Which we should all do. Or either life puts on you, for example, you get fired from a job or you lose your business or the regulations shut you down. Again, you're put into that complexity or what somebody is there to encourage you there, like your personal trainer, Umar, who was guiding you to get into complexity. Either way, get into complexity. It's better if it's self-inflicted because it's going to come anyway. Sheikh, two quick points I want to mention from what Brother Fawaz mentioned. It's how you do anything is how you do everything, mm. right? The man that's going to do one more rep in the gym when wow. nobody's watching, he's going to make that... Pause, you know, like, you gotta go pause, man. <laughs> he's going to make that one more call when nobody's watching. Mm. Mm. He's going to say that extra one more hour when nobody's watching. 
right? Because it's it's a it's a total system. Mm. It's a spillover. How you do anything is how you do everything. And the last point I want to mention, Sheikh, on the story of uh, Amar radiallahu Of course, the best examples belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the prophets and the sahabas. But it's, it's from our perspective, what keeps you going sometimes, even when you know there is an end or whatever, the love of the game. It's simply the love of the game. And me and Brother Mahdi was discussing, for me now, for a long time now, the end result, the money does not motivate me anymore. Mm. It's unlocking men. I actually sat down with this man who's worth $750 million mm -hmm. and he actually took me seriously, right? Uh, Sam Amin, 16 year old coming from Bangladesh, like cleaning up restaurants. And 15 years later, this gentleman takes me seriously mm -hmm. and I'm actually pitching to him and he carefully considers it, makes some suggestions. And actually a week later, emails back to me and talks to me. Oh, wow. For me, that's unlocking a level in the game. Mm. For me, it's not the commission or when it's going to come, when the deal is going to close. Now I'm more confident. Mm. So it's, I'm unlocking. So it's the love of the game. Like you're taking the bull by the horn, maybe next time take a rhino by the horn. You know, <laughs> like, you know just <laughs> unlock yourself, level up the game. And when the love of the game comes, everything else becomes irrelevant. You just keep going. It's not matter what's happening. Result becomes irrelevant. Ah, Sam, sorry, bro. You see, you said how you do anything is how you do everything. Yep. And it reminds me of the other thing we spoke about the other day. A man reveals himself and how he handles trifles. Mm. You, trifles. How how he handles trifles. Oh, trifles, trifles. A man reveals his character to you with how he handles trifles. If you want to get the measure of a man, don't ask him about big questions and go direct to the point. No, you need to go the indirect route. Let's go for a workout, bro. How does he handle that extra rep or two reps? How does he deal with the lettuce? Uh, trifles. Oh, wow. I, you can get the... I was, I, I, I was training uh, Muay Thai in the gym when I was in the UK. My orphan son was holding the pads. I was hitting them a bit extra hard just to like, let him know. Like, you know, I know you're young, but you need to start getting used to these types of, this type of uh, uh, force. Anyway, we had a particular drill. And whenever we're given drills, cardio drills, I have to finish first. Yeah. I have to win. Well, no one's in competition. Like, it's not a competition, but I have to finish first. So he was taking his time switching from side to side. There were all, uh, alternate kicks, right kick and then left kick, right? And then I said to him, at the end of that set, I said to him, you need to understand something. On these drills, I have to win. I know it's not a competition, but I make it a competition. I need to win. That's it, period. And I wanted him to know that, to cultivate that mindset in his head, which is, how you do anything is how you do everything. Nobody was watching us. It mm. wasn't a competition. Coach is not going to say nothing. But I know I could have gone harder. I could have gone faster. I could have finished first. That's enough. Mm. And even when you're at the top of your level, you're still competing with yourself. Yep. You never, because that's the problem. A lot of us, when we reach that level where we're first, we get comfortable. It's still beating that previous version of me. And that's something that you have to become grounded in. I'm always trying to be better than yesterday. Development is something that we have to do. The moment we stop developing, that's where things come crashing down. It's a constant cycle of development. That's why I'm, I'm, I laugh and I always tell you, when I meet people, especially I've noticed people from like, that haven't made more than six figures, they have this mindset of like, they think they're a lot more knowledgeable than they are mm. on, on business and life, just uh, uh, that six figure mark. But then the guys that have seven, it's like, yeah, like uh, there's still a lot more I don't know. It's funny because guys from six to seven figures are more, humble than guys from zero to, to, um, yeah. to six figures. I mean, it's, it's, it baffles it, it, me. It's actually, it's actually funny. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a young brother who joined our Righteous mm. Schools Academy, right? And um, Alarm Badik, bro. The first week he came, he, he was trying to do his own thing. He told he's got a lot of confidence. Cocky, but in a good way. But he didn't know what he was doing. So he had a session with me, like a group session. And I just told him to do a couple of things. Alarm Badik, he posted a few days later, he signed his first high-ticket client, $1,000. Mm, right? Sure. So... High ticket is subjective, but <laughs> not as in it's not as in some people would. Genuinely. Of course. <laughs> so then, then a couple of days later, I got my second, got my third. Right. So he was actually, um, you know, uh, a hot lead for Ascension into our mid ticket service where we do consultancy and, and mentorship for, for, for some of these brothers. Right. So he messaged back the, um, our sales rep and he goes, oh, I don't need it. Oh, yeah. He's like, I don't need it. He's like, uh, there's enough value here. Like, I'm good now. Does that make sense? Mm. So the brother was like, 
Oh, okay, cool. we, we got people in line, bro. It's it's not an issue. Like, <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? But I, I, I was like, this, this is a good kid, man. He actually got a lot of potential because he actually took what I said, implemented it, and saw results are lambatic. And, and he's very young, very young, like under the age of 20. So I said to the brother, I'd reach back out to him for his sake. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? For his sake. Um, I don't think anything transpired. And like, you know, you, you just generally, the, I, I like to keep it an eye on our churn rate and everything. And I know he's, he's one of the guys that's, that's basically, he's um, cancelled his subscription. Wow. wow. So, so in my mind, I was like, he learned it all. <laughs> you know, that reminds me of a quote from uh, so Pete. So, a man who, who has slaked his thirst promptly turns his back on the well. Oh, wow. You heard this. Mm. It's in Fort I haven't heard it. That's deep. That's yeah, deep. Yeah. Man. Does you say that again, though? A man who has slaked his thirst promptly turns yeah. back on the world. Wow. It's Pete, because that brother, he's going to go out there and, like, the, he's, he's, you know, whenever, business is all about, as you said, unlocking new levels, right? Every time you improve one thing, it's like whack-a-mole. Another problem just comes out, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, you fix this, another problem just appears. So when he hits that first problem, he's going to want to come back in. Price is going to have gone up, by the way. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, it's just, it's just enough. If he comes back, brother, he has good traits. Oh, 100%. Brothers wouldn't come back out of arrogance. You know, I genuinely believe he will. Yeah. Because I, I, I saw in him khair. You know what I'm saying? But it was just the concept of, bro, you really, that silly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, here you got six live calls a week mm -hmm. where we will give you attention and fix right. your problems live. Right, right. Sales, market, whatever. Yeah. But it's like, oh, I'm good. So that's why I feel like it was a big <laughs> blessing for me to not money come in my life easily yeah. or mm. early on because i don't know how people deal with like a lot of people were talking about one gentleman made like quarter million and he's 19 nine, not 19 dollars 19 years old made oh. quarter million from crypto or something and i was talking about hey, bro i don't know what i would do if i if i was it in that destroys. position it, it destroys, destroys you life. and that's that's one thing i've noticed as well like i was dealing with a client alhamdulillah he ended up mm. achieving success in the first month of working with him he very quickly he went from like doing 4k uh, monthly and then he automatically like after the month he was on like 12k after working with us and you know after that i seen him become a bit laggy he wasn't showing up to the calls on time you know he's, he's a boss now like, mm -hmm. he's a boss he's saying yeah 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 got you bro got you got you and that's it's the same thing what happens he gets crushed he comes back oh. i tell him we're double now and that's that's well like that's the game that's that's, that's, that's that's the game the game is the game yeah it's not even a revenge thing. It's for his own no, benefit. No, no, no. That's, that's for his own benefit. They, they learn. And some people only learn through being slapped in the face, you know? Brothers, well, I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed this. We are at time now. I genuinely, genuinely came here with a sense of curiosity and wanting to learn. And I believe that Allah Azza wa Jal uh, allowed me to learn a lot from you guys today. So um, one thing I definitely know is that I'm going to be going to the gym today. <laughs> and I'm going to, I'm going to cause myself some pain. Yes. Sure. Self-inflicted. Don't worry. We're not sadistic here. Yeah. Or are we? Slightly. <laughs> Is it bad? <laughs> I don't know. We can maybe discuss right, that. The next one. Episode. Episode. So, guys, me and Liza was a bless each every single one of you for listening. So Brother Mahdi, he has got black label. Um, this is not going to be relevant to the overall majority of you. But for those of you brothers who consider yourself um, from the upper echelon of the, you know, Muslim entrepreneurial world, <laughs> then perhaps you can, inshallah ta'ala, follow the links below and get more information. And possibly you may be privileged with access. It's not for everyone. They have a serious vetting process. And, um, you know, it's something that is a true service for the ummah. Uh, brother Sam here, if you guys want to make money through real estate, please, the links are all below. Enter into this funnel. And, uh, you know, funnel created by the <laughs> one and only. And inshallah ta'ala, you know, um, you know, I've, I've, I've been with Sam now uh, for a while, for a minute now. I've had lots of conversations. Genuine brother. Uh, his reputation precedes him, which is why I feel comfortable recommending you guys to give him your money. I don't do that for a lot of people. Brother Fuaz, Allah Mabarik, is actually now officially my coach, yeah. right? He's going to help me perform at a high level. Amazing. So guys, if you, if you, and again, you only serve entrepreneurs now, right? Yeah, strictly. Okay, so. Mashallah. Right. Mashallah tabarakallah. I would request you maybe also add in students of knowledge. Talk about that. They need it too. <laughs> they need it too. Sure. But nonetheless, inshallah ta'ala, um, please check him out at the link below. As you can see, these brothers have, um, you know, value to give. Share the podcast. And if you guys would like the same panel, then just go crazy in the comments. 
وإذا سلم يا الله بلسي سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام بيوروفا بيل ما شاء الله